Good morning, and welcome to the 13th edition of the annual State of the Union Conference, Building Europe in Times of Uncertainty. I am pleased to introduce Professor Renaud de Hoos, President of the European University Institute, to open the conference and deliver his welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you at this 13th edition of the State of the Union Conference. This conference is for us a wonderful opportunity to showcase some of the research that gets done at the Institute and to reach out to our many interlocutors outside of the academic sphere. This is typically one of the highlights of uh, the academic year at the Institute. As you know, the theme chosen for this edition is building Europe in times of uncertainty. Allow me to say that uh, this could not be more timely. No one, I think, will dispute that we are going through a very uncertain period. War is raging on our continent, and major transformations, such as climate change or the extraordinary development of artificial intelligence, are changing our way of life. In response, European countries seem at times tempted to go it alone, but they're quickly reminded of a basic reality. On their own, they count only up to a certain point. As President Mattarella recalled in a speech he recently delivered in Krakow, Poland, Europe cannot become a major player if it remains seen as, I quote, a temporary and varying sum of national moods and interests. And therefore, by definition, a perennially unstable structure." End of quote. Europe as we know it today was also built in times of uncertainty and in response to crises. After the Second War, the continent was literally in shambles. But its founders had a vision according to which, by cooperating, we would become stronger. So they laid the foundations for this unique construction that seemed almost unthinkable at the time. Now, the sense of this political innovation is at times called into question. Some, inside and outside the Union, feel neglected. Others claim the right to a greater say on European decisions. Others still accuse the Europeans to be blind to the problems of the rest of the world. Well, let me say this, one of the rationales for today's event is precisely to offer a platform where such issues and many others can be openly debated. I'm therefore delighted to see so many representatives from the world of politics, uh, academia, the media, the private sector, and civil society here at our institute. Through their exchange of views and ideas, they will help us add building blocks to the construction and strengthening of our European home, as is our role as a European university. Thank you for joining us uh, for these two days. I hope you will enjoy uh, the discussions uh, that are about to start and look forward to see you in the many parallel sessions that will now start. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. You can see the live side yeah. from the back. Okay. Wait one or two seconds and then you can start. Okay. I would love some.
edition of the State of the Union organized by the European University Institute here in Florence. My name is Miguel Montedalgat and I'm a doctoral researcher at the European University Institute. And my name is Franca Feisel. I am also a doctoral researcher here at the European University Institute. And together with Miguel, we are delighted to introduce to you the panel Governing Fast and Slow and Democratically. This panel is convened by Ponte Europa, which is the EUI's researcher-led civic engagement platform. Our mission is, with Ponte Europa, about bridging academia and civil society. So, we want to bring the debates about European politics that we have here at the Institute closer to local audiences and, in civil society, create space for democratic deliberation. And it is out of this, our concern with democratic inclusion, and the tension that we perceive here with the crisis politics we observe in many areas nowadays, oh my God, that the idea nice. for this panel arose. Because what do crises do? Crises like the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russian war in Ukraine, and the economic and financial crisis ensuing from both, they create urgency. And urgency means governing fast, typically. And that can stand in quite a contrast with genuine democratic governance, because we all know democratic procedures take time. And on top of that, in crisis times, the active promotion of democracy as a policy tends to play second fiddle to the supposedly more pressing policy objectives. So what we want to discuss in our panel with our amazing panelists today is whether and how European democracies, and in particular the European Union, as the transnational democracy that it is, respond to this need to, on the one hand, deliver urgent policy output, but on the other hand, doing so without compromising democratic principles. So we will discuss today how certain input and output mechanisms in crisis-driven or crisis-influenced EU policy areas fare in keeping this balance. And uh, for this, we are joined by experts in areas that are defined by this tension between urgency and democracy. And in this panel, we will adopt a comparative approach, zooming in on the climate crisis and the EU's just transition policy, as well as on the geopolitical crisis and the EU's enlargement policy. On stage, we have with us Anna Sobiak, policy coordinator at the European Commission's Director General for Energy and EU fellow at the Robert Schuman Center for Advanced Studies, and Milena Lazarevic, um, program director at the European Policy Center Belgrade. But before starting the discussion, we would like to invite Sandrine Dixon de Clev, co-president of the Club of Rome and chair of the European Commission's expert group on the economic and societal impact of research and innovation for some opening remarks. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone to this opening session. As co-president of the Club of Rome, the institution that commissioned the limits to growth 50 years ago, commissioned by Aurelio Pace, a fellow Italian, I come before you both alarmed and hopeful. Alarmed that leaders did not heed the warnings of the limits to growth, that humanity's footprint would take us far beyond the planetary boundaries and become our greatest existential threat. Alarmed that we have lost 50 years in governing with the deep warnings of the limits to growth in mind, and now are faced with the multiple crises and tipping points shown in our scenarios already 50 years ago. We need a 21st century governance model that is fit for purpose, that can both govern through and for chaos and complexity, and build in long-term resilience to future shocks and stresses, so that people's lives and livelihoods are secure, and all citizens can thrive and not just survive, not only here in Europe, but across the globe. Trying to balance optimizing the current system and reimagining the system altogether, basically building a plane while we fly it. That is why our provocation today is so incredibly relevant. How can we turn today's context of the perma crisis into a catalyst for new governance that gives us the hope in the short term and makes us all good ancestors for future generations? The three C's, climate, COVID, and conflict, are on our doorstep. They've demonstrated the high degree of interdependence between people around the world and the fragility of our current value chains and geopolitical relationships. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Cross-cutting challenges require an integrated approach, and yet we continue to govern in the short term and foregoing our long-term vision. 
Since the early days of the pandemic, the European Commission's Economic and Societal Impacts of Research and Innovation Expert Group, quite a mouthful, and myself as chair and also co-chair, one of the esteemed professors at this very institute, Andrea, have been thinking about how do we avoid relying exclusively on short-termism and instead adopt a protect, prepare, and transform approach as the most comprehensive strategy for resilience. Protect through a swift and coordinated response in cases of emergency with policies that leave no one behind when crisis hit. Prepare for a broad set of future risks through coordination, foresight, community involvement, and reskilling. Transform the economy and society through challenge-driven approaches to research and innovation, triggering change that addresses the root causes of our current dysfunctional systems. I fundamentally believe in this approach because falling short of a full protect, prepare, transform approach and agenda means ushering in an era of damage control and short-term reactive decision-making. This would place the EU in a constant state of crisis management, exactly where we are today, in which crises never end and their cascading impacts must be constantly mitigated. There would be no such thing as time of peace, no time to fix the roof. Against the difficult backdrop of the pandemic years, this has led EU institutions to strengthen their response and crisis management capabilities, and we should build on this. Many new initiatives and emerging policy priorities try to mitigate the consequences of external shocks when they hit, yet much less is being done to prevent the shocks from occurring in the first place. In other words, the EU is very attentive to the protect and increasingly wary of the prepare phase and definitely not in the transform phase. Today's challenges require both anticipatory governance, long-term systems thinking, and adaptive, agile decision-making. We must understand the real nature and root causes of the major crises we are in and realize that we are no longer in monocrisis mode. Rather, we live in a polycrisis age which may evolve into a permacrisis. So how can we build from a negative peace approach, chiefly based on the absence of physical violence? The EU must become the champion of a positive peace, of a more holistic approach. We must take into consideration also the way in which our systems interrelate the economy, the financial system, and the governance system to put in place the right underbelly for change through democratic processes. Embracing a positive peace and sustainable development in the age of a polycrisis means leveraging EU polycentric governance to build resilience and harnessing Europe's leadership in transformative technologies, social cohesion models, and innovative creative industries for the green and social transition, as well as its vocation towards human-centric digital transformation, a digital transformation that services people and planet and prosperity together rather than just focuses on AI or intellectual property. A positive peace approach will also ensure that policymaking focuses on creating the necessary deliberate democratic processes that service the needs of people, planet, and prosperity at the same time, whilst understanding what is most essential to people's lives and changing our economic and financial systems to move beyond growth into a society and governance of well-being. This is what the European Parliament's conference in two weeks will be about, moving beyond growth into understanding new indicators to measure economic development across Europe and the globe. The real choice is not between protection and transformation, as we are faced with the Ukrainian crisis on our doorstep, inflationary measures, and of course, energy poverty and food poverty. Rather, it is between the fulfillment and the impasse of the EU project. Europe is at a crossroads between two alternatives, following a short-term reactive path, regardless of its impact on transformation, thereby risking further lock-in for societies and economies into suboptimal structures, or embedding protective and preparedness measures into a deeply transformative agenda. This latter option is Europe's only successful path. This requires putting in place an action plan that combines state-of-the-art knowledge, technology, human ingenuity with new strategies and transformative policies so as to enable initiatives 
like the EU R&I missions and the Green and Social Deal to address key challenges, once again, for people, planet, and prosperity together. But how do we reconcile the needs of today with the call for enhanced preparedness and systemic transformation? We understand that it's extremely difficult to keep to a long-term vision of transformation in times of emergency. We have seen what has happened on our own doorstep as we've reacted with short-term measures to continue drilling, for example, in Africa and ensuring that we still have some relationships around gas and oil when we should actually be phasing out our dependency on oil and gas altogether. Now, of course, the Ukrainian invasion has enabled us to wean ourselves off Russian gas, but has still, in its impasse, created other stranded assets. So we must think about a deeper plan of action to avert future tipping points. A likely scenario today is that financial resources mobilized through next generation EU will be spent to contain a wave of nationalism and protect Europeans from massive spikes in energy and food prices, yet precipitate Europe in an unstable status quo ante, putting at risk the very essence of our democratic and collaborative union. The real failure for Europe is thus the failure to transform and to adopt systemic solutions responding to the complexity of today's challenges. Yet the pandemic showed that we can transform and we can do it fast. Allocate the necessary funds and capital flow, strengthen communities through solidarity, change habits and roll out game-changing, life-saving innovations for all, not just the few, in a very short time frame. That the state can be an authoritative democracy, servicing people's needs and the collective, rather than an authoritarian autocracy servicing power. When COVID hit, we quickly shifted from the me to the we. Yet there were grumbles, demonstrations, and pushback. But there was an overall massive shift towards protecting all citizens at the pace and scale necessary for immediate transformation. Therefore, the imperative going forward is to give real meaning to the protect, prepare, transform approach by taking concrete action to fundamentally overhaul the way in which policies and strategies are conceived, presented, and implemented within a deliberate democratic policy-making structure. Let me close with this. Pursuing long-term goals while adjusting for short-term emergencies is a challenging modus operandi and requires adequate changes in the way decisions are adopted at all levels of government. Decision makers have to both learn to prepare, that means investing in strategic foresight, agility, and so-called optionality, to enhance preparedness and prepare to learn on the go, to experiment, to take risks when crisis hits. While a lot of emphasis is currently placed on agile governance, the latter is just a tiny portion of the change that needs to occur in government and probably not the most salient. To adopt a thorough protect and prepare and transform approach, we also need value-based decision-making. Value-based decision-making is exactly what myself and former commissioner Yanis Potochnik decided was necessary when we created the compass for systems change. A compass which would implement our mission-driven approach here at Europe and the policies that we have based on 10 key purpose-driven principles. We immediately saw the tension growing between applying the European Green Deal and the need to solve the crisis and race towards continued competitiveness. This tension continues to build today as the Ukrainian invasion, even if we have seen the positive impacts of the shift away from gas, as I indicated, inflationary impacts, energy poverty, food poverty, are testing our resolve. Our compass for policymaking is based on these 10 key principles, which also readdresses what governance should look like. Redefining governance is not only the way in which we need to look at governance here through the institutions and the eyes of European citizens, but also the way in which we address the rest of the world. It is important to address the planetary emergency we face head on. Failure to do so could lead to the collapse of democratic structures and civil unrest. As shown by our most recent Earth for All scenarios, a project that again we created through the COVID times, very much looking at the dangers of inequality 
to democracy and the growing instability that we will have if we don't take into consideration inequality, poverty, while we put in place the new models for governance. This was shown very much in our well-being and social tension index, that as wealth has increased, well-being has decreased across the globe. That as well-being decreases, as social tensions increase. As social tensions increase, we risk a force against democratic principles and processes. That is why we need to think through the way in which we build citizen agreement on this journey. How do we transition with citizens? How do we create deliberate democracies, citizen assemblies, in order to engage more citizens in our decision making and indicate to them that yes, it's painful. We are faced with chaos, but we must in ensuring the protection, the preparedness, and the transformation of our economy, our financial system, and our governance system, take into consideration the needs of citizens. And together, if we have an honest conversation of what democracy looks like, of what growth looks like, then we can start to build a Europe which is resilient to future shocks and stresses. Solutions are there. What is required now is political will. We do not have another 50 years to spare. I call upon this panel and all of you as you move through your deliberations here as we discuss the State of the Union to think about a positive peace, to think about transformation as a model for a positive future for Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, Anna Milena, thank you very much for being here. The first question we would like to ask you both is how do you perceive this tension between crisis politics and democratic governance or democracy promotion in your field of policy action? Um, starting with Anna, the EU's just transition is an attempt to implement reforms that are necessary to respond to the climate crisis while making sure that the asymmetrical impact um, that um, these transformations across regions have are accounted for. Um, yet the urgency of the climate crisis might favor a top-down approach when designing uh, this type of response, which in turn can generate backlashes. I'm thinking, for instance, of the rise of the farmer citizens movement in the Netherlands. How do you perceive this tension? Thank you very much, Miguel, for this question. I'm delighted to be here and discuss with you a just transition. And before I reply to your question, let me please remind the audience what a just transition is. Because it's a quite a vague concept. So basically, it all started uh, with Paris Agreement and also in any formal documents you have at an international labor organization that define it, that when we're reaching climate neutrality and transition, it's also about ensuring that we have decent work and jobs. So basically, any time when we have a change, a transition from one to another, we make sure that we mitigate the consequences of this transition. So in other words, a little bit simpler words, uh, I see a just transition as a socio-economic dimension of a clean energy transition towards climate neutrality. So we have this uh, mantra at EU level, leaving no one behind. So just transition at EU policy level is at the core of EU Green Deal, Europe's growth strategy. It's a really important concept. It's about inclusiveness. It's about cooperation. It's about dialogue. So when we are going through a change, through a challenging, transformative change, what we heard in the keynote speech, it's difficult. And to use the words of Executive Vice President Timmermans, it's a bloody difficult process, but we must do it. In this process, we have to listen to the needs and make sure that 
we do not harm and we basically that we support the citizens which are going to be most affected by change. So here in this particular context, we're talking about uh, people in employed in the in coal sectors, in very in energy intensive sectors. They will be the most affected, the vulnerable uh, citizens. So we have to also make sure that we listen to their needs. And we together try to develop, or we do develop indeed, joint solutions for that. So that's why another aspect which is very much shows and demonstrates why just transition is intrinsically a demo democracy, democratic concept. Because we're trying to provide tailored-made solutions to the needs of the citizens at a very local level. At the community level, we're thinking how we can help the families which are affected, the workers when they lose their jobs, how can we build a better future for the next generation so the areas, the territories where uh, coal mines are can still be attractive places to live and work when the coal mines are closed, where the energy intensive sectors will be transformed. So I hope in this way it answers your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And now passing to Milena, we want to zoom in a little bit on the EU's promotion of democracy and its external action. Because historically, the EU's enlargement policy has had quite a profound, but also one can say ambiguous impact on its candidate countries, including on democratic consolidation and institutions in these countries. But now, of course, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that has changed the picture quite profoundly. And one could argue it creates incentives for the EU to, to turn a blind eye on democracy promotion in these countries. The priority might shift to making sure that, especially Eastern European accession countries or candidates, do not fall into Russia's sphere of influence. Right? And that can mean perhaps compromising on democratic principles. How do you see this tension between geopolitical crisis politics in this case and democracy promotion playing out in the EU's enlargement politics at the moment? Uh, thank you very much and uh, I'm really pleased uh, and honored to, to be here and uh, speak at this panel. Uh, my apologies for my voice, um, uh, I have a bit of a cold. Um, indeed, uh, the, um, there is a growing tension between uh, the proclaimed, um, uh, the proclaimed uh, objectives of uh, EU's enlargement policy, which includes uh, and is based on democratic transition and democratic consolidation of the candidate countries and supposed transformation of those countries into uh, consolidated and uh, well-developed um, uh, democracies and the growing um, uh, geopolitical uh, imperative. From the perspective of somebody who's been working working on the EU accession process um, of the region and especially of Serbia, the country I know best, uh, over the past, well, 17 years. Um, I can say that from our perspective, the accession process has always been uh, dominated by various kinds of crises. Crises which maybe were not seen that way uh, from the perspective of the EU, of the European Union. And I think that for that reason, um, the EU has allowed itself to um, uh, actually uh, focus and to even give precedence to uh, maintaining stability, first of all, stability uh, in the Western Balkan region, uh, the Western Balkan region which uh, did enter the EU accession process following uh, a bloody war uh, of the dissolution of, uh, of former Yugoslavia. Um, and simply uh, looking from the perspective of the region and uh, especially uh, in, the, in the last years working uh, in the Serbian civil society, what I could observe is that the EU has allowed itself multiple times to focus and to give precedence to stability, maintaining stability uh, and peace in the region over the imperative of uh, supporting democratic, uh, democratic consolidation uh, in the region. And even um, for, uh, for that uh, um, uh, phenomenon, the, their, their there's been a special term coined uh, called stabilitocracy. So this creation of stable regimes which uh, are able to maintain uh, peace and 
stability overall uh, in the region, but at the expense of democratic governance. And this simply means that um, uh, authoritarian or semi-authoritarian leaders in the region have been given sort of a, a, a pass on uh, implementing or even eroding uh, democratic, basic de democratic institutions um, in order for, uh, for the EU to maintain stability and, uh, and keep that in its focus. Now, the civil society in the region has worked hard uh, over the years to uh, increase the focus on stability, on uh, democracy and uh, uh, creation and uh, uh, consolidation of democratic institutions. We saw with the uh, 2020 revised enlargement, so-called revised enlargement methodology that the European Commission published, that um, functioning of democratic institutions, which by the way was part of the initial Copenhagen criteria uh, uh, from 1993, so functioning and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, proceeding of uh, uh, democratic institutions was part of the fundamental uh, EU's enlargement policy. But we saw that uh, over the years, civil society has insisted on uh, actually uh, increasing the focus on, uh, on democratic institutions. However, Russia's war in Ukraine has again um, uh, led to, 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 to a shift, to a change in this, um, in this perspective, and the EU is now in danger it's its own fundamentals first approach. Fundamentals first meaning that uh, democratic consolidation, uh, strengthening of the, of the governance systems should be the basis for all the other reforms in the region. Um, basically, uh, uh, over, the, over the past year or so, what we have seen is that the EU is again um, uh, focusing on um, uh, um, resolving the crisis, which is mainly in the region seen in Serbia with the increased uh, Russian influence. And in order to uh, to, help, um, um, uh, to help alleviate and to, to reduce uh, Russia's uh, influence uh, in the region and especially in Serbia, we have seen again uh, a focus on, um, uh, on, on this geopolitical imperative, uh, supporting the Serbian regime um, uh, in, in, um, in uh, terms of uh, um, economic development, uh, energy transition, but again losing sight of the functioning of democratic institutions. Now, of course, um, uh, seeing this trade-off, the question is how will the EU actually support proper transformation of Serbia and other candidate countries into future functional EU member states. Because this is not something that can be done sequentially. You cannot first focus on um, expulsion of Russian influence from the region and then focus on democracy. Because while we are focusing on expulsion of Russia's influence in the region and in Serbia, if the democratic institutions are further eroded and further uh, dismantled, there will be nothing left to work with afterwards. So my point is that the EU needs to embed this democratic focus into all of its policies, and it has to find a way to deal with these issues at the same time, to, to deal with them su simultaneously as part of the same larger problem, rather than as separate problems in which uh, it will focus first on one of them and then uh, uh, only after uh, hopefully the, the, the bloody war in Ukraine is over, uh, then start focusing on, on democracy. This is simply not going to work that way. Thank you so much, Milena, for this powerful call. And I think what transpired from both of your contributions so far is that crisis politics indeed carry with themselves the danger of democratic erosion, be it through neglecting democratic institutions or losing entire groups of citizens along the way. And therefore, our set second question wants to focus a bit on the strategies that, that can be or also have been put in place to counter democratic erosion in the context of crisis politics. And now circling back to Anna and to the climate crisis, while we have seen different solutions in the past years tested in Europe to include citizens more in democratic decision-making on these topics, and I'm thinking in particular of, for instance, the climate convention for the Citizens' Convention for Climate in France, which was very much about how to reduce carbon emissions, but in the spirit of social justice. But then also that brings us back to the ambiguity, because in that instance, the executive ultimately failed to deliver on the promise to genuinely take up the citizens' proposals in the ensuing French climate laws. So how about the EU's just transition policy? How is it doing in channeling citizens' voices? Thank you very much. Indeed, just transition, as I mentioned before, it's a very starting, it's a very bottom-up process, and it's listening to the voices of regional, local authorities, civil society, trade unions, businesses, youth organizations, and puts around the table together
climate activists with coal miners and trade unions, which, believe me, it's a quite a challenging process to make all of them speak around uh, the table and find together a joint solutions and strategies. And all of this takes time. It's a capacity building process. It's a slow process. And it's quite important to, to mention it and to keep it in mind, because when the crisis came, as all of us noticed, we were in so-called perfect storm, COVID crisis, energy crisis, war in Ukraine, everything fast forward. And you need to act very quickly. You need to respond. Do we have time to deliberate? Do we have time for the dialogue? Do we have time to reflect on all the changes that we're facing with the time frame of 2030, 2050? We need to act now. And this, the crisis mode, how do you find here a compromise? Because the policies, the priorities changes and policies need to adapt to those changing circumstances. And I think at EU level, I think we did a pretty good job. Because we manage, in the times of the big crisis, still to keep in mind the importance of a just transition, the importance of the decarbonization, green transition, the importance of consulting uh, citizens to speaking with them, public consultations. It was not easy. It was not perfect as we would like to do it, but in the current circumstances, with all the challenges that we are facing, I think we did a pretty good job. Thank you. Uh, going back to the geopolitical crisis, uh, Milena, you have written about what you describe as the executive bias in the EU's enlargement policy. So this view that um, the EU would mostly focus when communicating with these candidate countries on the executive branch and would involve less parliaments and civic society uh, more broadly. Is it time for a change in this approach? Uh, yes, I mean, th this is not a new concept. This is a concept which was coined already during the, the accession uh, process of the Central and Eastern European countries. But I would say, and I, I, I would dare to claim that now it has become much more problematic than it was uh, uh, back then. Because, because of the overall democratic backsliding uh, and the dissolution of, of democratic institutions that we have observed over the region. I can only remind, for example, the, our audience that Serbia has fallen on the Freedom, um, Freedom House's Nations in Transit um, ranking uh, of, uh, of democracies um, from a semi-consolidated to uh, a hybrid regime, similarly to Poland and Hungary, I have to say. Um, but the point is that the logic of negotiations uh, for EU accession is based on the same logic as uh, the negotiations for any international agreement. So you have democratically elected uh, executive um, uh, branches, governments, which engage in negotiations, and then on the outcome of that, the parliaments and sometimes the entire electorate make their choice. However, I would claim that the EU accession process is a much deeper transformative process for the entire society. This is not just a negotiation for a simple international agreement. So a profound participation of civil societies and parliaments in the accession countries is paramount. And in the accession process so far, despite the fact that the European Commission and the EU overall have worked to increase the role of these uh, key actors, key stakeholders, has improved, still their role is not sufficient to curb this executive bias, in which, for example, I will just give you one, one example, the, the European Commission has accepted uh, as a sign of progress in the EU accession process, adoption of legislation which was passed through urgent parliamentary procedures without proper consultation and without even a proper parliamentary debate. Now, should the EU accept and recognize that a candidate country has made progress, for example, in the area of anti-corruption, if a candidate country has passed uh, key legislation in this area without proper uh, public consultation and parliamentary debate? 
No, it should not. So this is, this is why it is time for, for a change. And as I said, because the EU accession process and enlargement policy is, has always been dominated by various crises, inter-ethnic tensions in the region, etc., now again with, uh, with the um, uh, advent of new candidates, so Ukraine and Moldova, it is even more in a crisis mode, the entire enlargement policy. So the EU must find a way to mainstream uh, the, the focus on democratic institutions, on uh, the, uh, domestic deliberations, societal del deliberations, and support creation and, and consolidation of democracy throughout the process. Thank you, Milena. Um, we have one final question, very, very briefly, before opening the floor for discussion with the audience. Uh, and this is how do you prevent the crystallization of less democratic forms of governance or policy action after the immediate urgency of a given crisis. Um, Anna, is this a risk that we should be aware of in the context of the climate crisis? I think we can learn quite a lot from the past experiences. We can learn quite a lot from each other. Uh, across Europe. And I think here, that's why it's so important to cooperate, to share the experiences, and also to be honest with each other and build trust. And here I would come back to one of my favorite principles at EU level, which is so-called partnership principle, which is enshrined in EU regional policy. Indeed. And what the partnership principle is about is about the importance of involving all different groups in the governance. So we're talking about regional, local level, civil society, and all different phases of a policy making process as well. And it's important that, for instance, if I can go to the quite a micro level of now, territorial just transition plans, which were prepared, which allow carbon intensive regions where energy intensive industries are located and coal regions to tap into just transition mechanism, which in fact is the funding for just transition. There, they are, were involved in preparing those plans. They were consulted on those plans. Again, maybe not perfectly in all the countries, but they were. There was this mechanism, the principle in place. Hopefully, they will be involved in monitoring, also implementation of the plans. And this way, it gives the ownership. This again comes back to this concept of just transition being the, at the heart of the democracy and being the quintessential element. So I think if we keep it in mind that we need to have this um, all the time listening to the voices and the needs of, of our citizens, we are on the right way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And Milena, same question to you. For one, has the geopolitical crisis changed the EU's enlargement policy on a permanent basis? And also building on what you said earlier, well, what would you recommend for getting the EU's enlargement policy out of the crisis mode in which you illustrated it has been in for a long time already before the Russian war in Ukraine and into a more democracy and people-centered approach? Well, the EU is very good at designing nominally good policies, but then very bad at properly um, uh, implementing them. Um, and uh, in the EU in EU's enlargement policy, there is this principle, fundamentals first, which means that fundamental reforms, basically all reforms uh, surrounding the Article 2 uh, basic values, fundamental values, need to be uh, uh, focused on first, and basically uh, they, they become um, the, 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 the so-called blocking uh, chapter in the accession negotiations, meaning that if a country is not making progress in the fundamental areas, then it cannot progress overall in the negotiations. However, in the implementation, this has not been the case. So now we are seeking and looking for um, methodological, procedural changes uh, and innovations of the process that can actually uh, force the EU to be more consistent in the way that uh, it implements its policy. One of those proposals uh, which is being discussed as we speak is a proposal that I co-authored. It's called uh, the, the model of staged accession to the EU, which is based on the premise that the fundamentals first policy should of course, remain the, the foundation of the process, but that the EU should finally start doing something that, well, nominally it should be doing anyway, but it hasn't really been doing that, that 
countries can, can gain benefits uh, and, um, in, the, in the process, in the uh, EU accession process, only as they improve their compliance with the EU acquis, but also with the fundamental uh, values uh, which, are, uh, which are the basis of the entire process. Now, how can the EU do that? Well, first of all, the European Commission needs to start doing its rankings, its um, uh, assessments of the reforms in the, in the candidate countries in a much more credible way. At the same time, member states need to focus their attention uh, in this process on precisely those assessments of the Commission's, um, uh, commission's assessments of the reforms and uh, progress uh, of the countries in complying with the EU's conditionalities rather than reserving their vetoes and their objections later on when uh, the Commission already makes its recommendations, but then we have a situation that although the Commission has recommended, for example, for Kosovo to uh, get visa-free regime years ago, or for North Macedonia and Albania to open accession negotiations again years ago, then we have vetoes of individual member states which object, which disagree with the, the Commission's recommendations, or they impose certain bilateral reasons, etc., to block the process. Now, this is the cancer of EU's enlargement policy and of promotion of the EU's democratic model. Uh, so, basically, creating a much more predictable uh, mo uh, uh, EU enlargement policy and really sticking to the logic that if a country is assessed to have uh, progress to have increased its, uh, its um, uh, compliance with the EU's uh, uh, conditionalities that this country then uh, can progress. And one more thing, just as, as a last sentence. Um, Anya spoke about honesty. I think honesty is key here. The EU needs to be much more honest about the in problems, internal problems with democracy with its own member states and not treat candidates um, as, uh, let's say, lower, uh, lower uh, kind of uh, um, uh, states which need to um, improve and accept EU's uh, models. Problems of democracy are everywhere, and I think that honesty in this process would mean that the same tools, the same uh, medicines are applied both for the member states and for the candidate countries. We need to treat the problem as a joint problem in order to come to solutions that are going to bring the enlargement region and the EU closer together. Thank you so much, Milena, and I really like this emphasis on, on honesty. I feel it's kind of a, a common theme that transpired throughout Sondrine's opening, Anna's interventions, and your contributions in the sense that, well, it's not going to be easy, and we need to be honest about that, but precisely that's why we need to take the people on board on the difficult journeys of transition in many different policy areas. So with that, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, I will ask you to introduce yourself, and then we can, you can ask your question. Right, the, the gentleman in the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Ivan Weberda with the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. I'd like to pick up on those last points, and in fact, on the honesty, on the fundamentals, and on the democratic backsliding. Uh, thank you very much for a really uh, exciting panel and for both comments from Anna and Milena. Do you think that the EU is uh, doing enough given the backsl democratic backsliding in member states such as Hungary and Poland? What kind of uh, incentive does that give to the candidate countries? And of course, Ukraine and Moldova, extremely important symbolic decision that was taken to make them candidate countries. The European Union has been slow in tackling the backsliding. Is it doing enough? And what needs to be done more if it is not doing enough? And uh, secondly, uh, especially to Milena, do you think that the conditions put on North Macedonia that uh, Bulgaria has pushed through comply with the conditions that the EU Commission has put forward for enlargement? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Milena, do you want to start? And then maybe Anna, you, you can As you prefer. Uh, yes, thank you very much even for, for the questions. Is the EU doing enough with its own member states? As somebody coming from civil society, I will always say no, it is not doing enough. Uh, it is clear that the Article 7 procedure is simply not effective in, in tackling this problem. However, we have seen over the past few years a growing body of law uh, revolving around the um, uh, 2020 conditionality regulation and the court's uh, decisions that related to, to this, um, uh, to this uh, regulation. So the EU is kind of bringing in um, the focus on uh, democracy and the uh, fundamental uh, values in its own member states through a through a small door, through a back door in a way. Uh, 
focusing on the uh, efficient management of the EU's budget and pro uh, protection of EU's financial interests in the implementation of, the, of structural funds. Um, I think that you know, money, money speaks, money is powerful, and uh, there has already been some impact and some, some progress uh, in, in these terms. This is probably uh, the only way that the EU can do that short of uh, a more profound reform uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the treaty framework. But in the meantime, I think that, of course, again, we're coming back to, to this uh, um, trade-off between crisis management and, and uh, long-term democratic uh, uh, governance. Um, the need to um, maintain solidarity among member states in the wake of, uh, of the war in Ukraine has taken precedence over uh, focus on, on uh, uh, some, of these, uh, some of these key principles, one, uh, one could say. But again, I think that uh, this entire body of law and practice which is being built around the condi conditionality regulation and its implementation is uh, quite promising until we see actually um, uh, a reform of the treaty framework, uh, hopefully, and uh, improvement of the Article 7 uh, procedure. procedure. Uh, the condition which was put on uh, North Macedonia, which basically, maybe for, uh, for members of the audience who are less familiar with this, um, uh, Bulgaria as a member state has managed to embed some bilateral requests uh, re related to the treatment of the Bulgarian, um, uh, Bulgarian uh, um, identity uh, in North Macedonia. Um, they have managed to in ingrain this into the um, framework for negotiations of a candidate country, basically exploiting the asymmetrical relationship between a member and a candidate. And this is actually a very dangerous precedent which shows that um, conditions which have nothing to do with democracy, with EU uh, law compliance, can become de facto conditions for a country to progress towards the EU. Now, how that is going to be um, uh, actually uh, implemented and how that is going to evolve over time is also going to, to depend on how Bulgaria um, 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 behaves in this entire process and how constructive it will be. But then that also depends on how forceful the EU will be in constraining uh, unilateralism uh, of member states in, uh, in the enlargement policy. My my advice at the time when Macedonia, North Macedonia accepted this deal, which they had to accept, they didn't have any other alternative, was that old member states, the member states which are more keen, I would say, on uh, democracy, on rule of law, should start sort of an informal group uh, monitoring uh, the behavior of the Bulgarian government in this relationship with the candidate country, North Macedonia, and basically using not only the political but also the legal leverage that they have, including even Article 7 proceedings, if the member state, Bulgaria, starts to abuse its um, asymmetrical position towards, uh, uh, towards North Macedonia, basically damaging or even breaching the fundamental values uh, of the EU, which also includes solidarity of member states. Um, Mark, do you have a question? In the, in the front. Mark, uh, just very briefly. Yes. Um, so, well, my name is Mark Steyert from the European University Institute, and my question actually goes to Anna and relates to the idea of involvement, participation, and consultation. So because, I, because I think there's two different things that the Commission does right now. So basically two concepts of how you can involve citizens or even civil society organizations, trade unions, so on. There's on the one hand the idea of listening and consulting, and on the other hand, oppo quite opposed to that, is actually the idea of involvement, participation, even collective regulation. Things that have been present at the EU level in the area of so social policy already, but they're kind of getting reinterpreted right now to mean more, to go more into the idea of, towards the idea of consultation and being less compelling and less compelling the institutions actually to do something. So my idea was, like, my question was actually, is the EU and especially also the Commission doing enough in really getting citizens, but also more organized citizens um, to participate, to really be involved in the regulation of the just transition as well. And I think, for instance, the partnership principle is actually a good example that speaks against it to some extent, because you, if you look at this, it, its implementation, not will be also in the RF. There's, for instance, some research that already shows that, for instance, in the area of childcare, actually there's some, some issues on the local level because there was not enough 
involvement of the local level as well. And there's some research that, for instance, shows that, for instance, people on the local level don't know how to spend this money that they get for childcare. But this is only one area. And my question was actually whether the idea of consultation and listening is not actually leading to a retransformation of democracy into a more top-down way of democracy, because it only it only relates to listening to citizens, but not really to making them participate in the regulation of the issues that are important for the just transitions. Anna, I know this was a very long question, but I'll ask you to uh, try to answer it in about one minute. <laughs> I absolutely loved your question. Thank you very much for that. And it is, it is challenging. But what I will tell you from the, from the cases that I followed, and I was lucky enough to participate in some of those consultations. And what I saw that often, but because what is important just to maybe highlight that EU does not only work with the member states, it also works uh, with local, regional authorities and with civil society, with cooperation. And around the table, when we would have different uh, representatives, they would be more likely to speak and o openly sometimes when the member state, the national government is not present. And I got the feedback that they were very grateful to EU policy makers that we listen to their concerns, let them speak. And trying to also, because this is very important, we all speak different languages. We speak different, I mean, not only in terms of the member state languages, but we use different jargon. And what is very important to communicate and explain why we're doing certain policies, what can we done, what can be done to assist people? Because here it's this kind of missing link that sometimes we're not that good at here, it's mea culpa, uh, if I can say at the EU level, that we don't necessarily explain clearly what we are doing and why we are doing and how it can benefit the citizens at the end. So I think this is for all of us a very important task to do, to communicate, to engage people, to cooperate, share those practices, but also listen uh, to one, one, one and another in this, uh, this context. So thank you very much once again for this one, and I really hope we will prove as the time goes that we are on the right track. Thank you. Okay, Milena Lazarevich, Anna Soviak, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much and stay tuned. Milena, thank you. Thank you. You too. My primary reason to choose to do my research at the EUI is the amount of academic freedom you have here compared to other universities. In general, other universities, other universities have uh, certain programs, uh, the faculties have certain programs they would like to research and if you want to apply to a PhD there you will have to change your research if you already have a research idea to fit the, the programs that they have the funding for. And at the UI this is not the case. You apply here with your own research proposal and your own research interests, which you also are not stuck with. If you want to make changes in the first year, that's still possible, but you have complete freedom in actually doing the research that really interests you. I think for a PhD that, you know, it takes four years of your life, it's quite an intensive thing. I think that's just so important to also keep your interests and I think if you, if you have to maybe adjust your interests to fit, to fit something else, you, you're more likely to maybe lose your interest down the line. We're a relatively small department. We have 12 professors, 12 full-time professors and a couple of part-time professors. Um, though we're small, we're perfectly formed, of course. Uh, we cover a wide range of different subject areas within law, so constitutional law, EU law, international law, comparative law and so on. And we, we're a diverse department in the sense that we adopt a wide range of different perspectives to the study of law, so we have um, critical perspectives, socio-legal perspectives, empirical perspectives. So although we're small, uh, we, you know, we, we 
encourage applications from students from a very wide range of perspectives uh, and topics. Doing your PhD here at the Department of Law at AUI, it's, uh, it's very well structured. I think they help PhD researchers here a lot to uh, maintain somewhat of steady progress. There's deadlines at the end of every study year, first, second, third year at least, and fourth year obviously should be done with your thesis. I think that helps a lot for researchers to stay on track, know where they're at, maybe have more confidence as well in their own ability to finish it in time. Um, I think that helps a lot in general and, and, and there's a great community to help you develop your research, find perhaps areas of research you didn't know about but would be immensely useful. There's professors, there's fellow researchers that do different things, but quite often even though they do different uh, things, have different research interests, they still come to uh, help you in your research by suggesting certain avenues of literature you hadn't thought about. And I feel like everyone here is always very open to help you, very open to have a conversation at least, either over lunch or coffee or in their office. And I think that really is extremely helpful. I think that leads to being able to do the best research you can. The relationship between a researcher and a research supervisor varies a lot because it depends on the supervisor and on the researcher. And it also varies by year. So the, the researcher can expect to have a reasonably intense relationship with their supervisor in their first year. So for example, I would expect to see my first year researchers every couple of weeks in their first term. Maybe that would be every three or four weeks in the second term unless the researcher is experiencing particular problems or difficulties. And normally before uh, a professor meets a, a researcher, they would often ask the researcher to submit something to them that they can read, so there's a basis for having a conversation. So I'd say, uh, aside, from it, aside from seminars, the two main uh, things that a supervisor offers are a reading and commenting service, and then a meeting opportunity to discuss the researcher's ideas. And we have, you know, because we're a relatively small department, we, we do have quite close contact with our researchers, which is one of the most rewarding bits of the job for us, and I think one of the most rewarding aspects of the EUI for the researchers. Obviously, the social life at the EUI has been very different to the last year and a half. I think that's true for anywhere in the world. Um, but taking the, the social life as it was the year and a half I was here before COVID, uh, started, uh, I think it's a very so much into an EY bubble because there's just so much on offer here. There's extracurricular activities <laughs> and even if they're what you would like to do, whether it's a sport or a hobby or interest, uh, if it's not there, you have the possibility to create that if you find like-minded people. But even Good morning, everybody. Maybe kindly ask you to take your seat, please. Thank you. A great place to be. And if you, in the first month you're here, really buckle down and learn as much Italian as possible, I think you can really enjoy the city even outside the EUI premise. People would be maybe um, one of the most important reasons to, to study here. Um, I would say also, oh, it's a very unusual institution. You don't find many international institutions which focus exclusively on uh, PhD and LLM research, so it's exclusively uh, doctoral and postdoctoral. Um, and that, that creates a, a, a really wonderful atmosphere. Um, the, the students, and of course we call them researchers, are are, are scholars in their own right and they interact with one another as scholars. So, well, it's a very intellectually serious and challenging environment and it, it certainly is that. Um, it's also a very supportive and friendly environment where the researchers really help one another develop their ideas and their projects. 
in a way that I've simply never seen anywhere else. So now, you know, when I see our graduates out and about in, in conferences and so on, I can always identify an EUI researcher, you know, because they've, they've had so much practice sharing ideas with their peers, with their professors, that they're just very accomplished at presenting their research, which also, of course, in career terms, is, is an advantage. I would recommend the EUI mostly for all the above reasons, the academic freedom, your pursuing your own research interests, great professors, great fellow researchers, a great environment in general. And I think if all of that doesn't convince someone yet, then it's still very nice weather in Tuscany as well. It's beautifully situated. Uh, I think you'll be very hard pressed to find a location as beautiful as this. And somehow that also is very inspiring to work and continue working.
Welcome to this session of the State of the Union Conference, where we are honored to have the participation of Italy's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Antonio Tajani. I give the floor now to Professor Renaud de Hus, President of the European University Institute. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, of course, a great honor to welcome today such a distinguished host as Minister Tajani. I want to stress that uh, we at the European University Institute are very much attached to uh, our tradition of having a distinguished Italian speaker uh, opening uh, the State of the Union conference. Italy, for us, is not only the wonderful host country that everybody knows. Um, it's also a country to which we are grateful for its unfailing support for the Institute and a partner for many of our development plans. The creation of the School of Transnational Governance some years ago and now the programs we are setting up to uh, provide training activities towards the Western Balkans and uh, countries from the Eastern Partnership. It is, therefore, a great honor for me to welcome uh, Vice President Antonio Tajani, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, and uh, well-known European, if I may put it that way, since he has, uh, as is well known, in his uh, past career served in uh, important positions, uh, first as Vice President of the European Commission and then as President of the European Parliament. He's therefore uniquely placed to address uh, the important issues that feature on uh, the agenda of our conference. And se posso aggiungerei uh, in modo più personale, è per noi, signor Ministro, un grandissimo piacere rivederla così fedele eh, all'Istituto. Eh, abbiamo avuto il piacere di averla pochi mesi fa, eh, grazie eh, di eh, aver trovato il tempo eh, per eh, questa visita e per eh, questa eh, apertura dei nostri lavori. Ma prima di darle la parola dobbiamo dare posto a uh, un uh, messaggio del Capo dello Stato uh, che uh, pregherò pertanto uh, il nostro Segretario Generale di voler presentare. Signor Vicepresidente del Consiglio, Ministro degli Affari Esteri, Mrs. Deputy President of the European Parliament, Commissioners, Members of the European Parliament, Vice President of the Tuscany Region, Signora Sindaco di Fiesole, Signor Sindaco di Firenze, Autorità Civili e Militari, cari amici e colleghi, ho l'onore oggi di leggere un messaggio che il Signor Presidente della Repubblica ha inteso recapitarci, non potendo essere qui con noi. La Conferenza sullo Stato dell'Unione, che si riunisce quest'anno a Fiesole, costituisce un'occasione preziosa per riflettere sul progetto europeo in un momento storico cruciale per il nostro continente e a pochi giorni dall'anniversario del 9 maggio, Festa dell'Europa. L'Europa, nel momento più incerto e sconfortante della sua storia, seppe fare dell'improbabile il possibile. I popoli europei, al termine di una guerra sanguinosa e fratricida, si unirono decidendo di costituire insieme il, primo, il proprio futuro, ponendo le fondamenta per una pace duratura. Da allora si è dato avvio ad un percorso europeo comune che, non senza difficoltà, contraddizioni e anche fallimenti, prosegue lungo la sua traiettoria rappresentando un'esperienza di successo. L'Unione sta affrontando nuovamente oggi emergenze globali di portata epocale, quali la pandemia Covid-19, 
le conseguenze drammatiche del cambiamento climatico, i flussi migratori incontrollati, la ingiustificabile aggressione della Federazione russa all'Ucraina e le sue devastanti conseguenze umanitarie, geopolitiche ed economiche. Prove che hanno offerto e richiedono ancora unità, solidarietà e uno sforzo congiunto nel difendere quei valori che ci uniscono e senza i quali l'Unione non avrebbe motivo di essere. Lo Stato di diritto, le libertà fondamentali, la democrazia. Oggi, più che mai, è necessario continuare la costruzione europea con coraggio. Nei momenti di maggiore difficoltà, rinnovarsi è essenziale e risolutivo. Costruire l'Europa nei tempi di incertezza, recita il tema scelto per la manifestazione odierna, cogliendo il senso della sfida. Possiamo trarre dalla storia una lezione. L'Europa ha dimostrato di saper affrontare le sfide e le crisi difficili, emergendone più forte e coesa. Le ragioni del patto fondativo europeo sono più che mai attuali. Con questi sentimenti auguro pieno successo alla vostra iniziativa. Sergio Mattarella. I am honored to introduce Italy's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Antonio Tajani. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me today in this very important event in Fiesole. Bonjour. Je pense que c'est très important, comme a dit le président de la République italienne, de réfléchir sur l'état de l'Union européenne. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Allow me to turn in my mother tongue in Italian. È giusto riflettere sulla nostra Unione europea in un momento particolare abbiamo una guerra alle porte dell'Europa, stiamo vivendo ancora gli strascichi della terza crisi dopo quella di Lehman Brothers e quella provocata dal coronavirus, quella provocata dall'innalzamento del prezzo dell'energia che ha provocato problemi in tutto il nostro continente e viviamo ancora un aumento preoccupante dell'inflazione. Cosa possiamo fare, cosa abbiamo fatto, cosa dobbiamo pensare per il nostro futuro? Per il governo italiano è chiaro che esistono due stelle polari per quanto riguarda la politica estera, una sono le relazioni transatlantiche, gli Stati Uniti sono il nostro principale alleato, l'altra stella polare si chiama Europa. Siamo Paese fondatore, vogliamo essere protagonisti con i nostri 60 milioni di cittadini della costruzione di un percorso che veda tutti quanti i popoli europei uniti per guardare con più ottimismo al futuro, per affrontare insieme le grandi sfide geopolitiche. Perché quando sarà terminata la guerra avremo dei giganti, la Cina, l'India, la stessa Federazione Russa, gli Stati Uniti, con i quali dovremo confrontarci. Certamente, e qui torna l'importanza di essere parte dell'Unione Europea, 
non potremo affrontare questa grande sfida globale come non possiamo affrontare quella di questi giorni, ma ancora di più in futuro, quindi l'Unione Europea non è qualcosa che riguarda il passato, ma che riguarda il futuro di tutti quanti noi, le grandi sfide se fossimo da soli. 60 milioni di italiani, per quanto capaci, intelligenti, inventivi, non potrebbero uscire, come si dire, vincenti da un confronto geopolitico, economico con gli altri. Quindi è nostro interesse, è una necessità quella di stare uniti. Ma stare uniti perché, solo per ragioni geopolitiche, certamente sono fondamentali. E dobbiamo fare di più, abbiamo notato ancora una volta quanto si sia indietro nella politica di difesa. Politica di difesa europea, se ne cominciò a parlare negli anni 50, poi venne nel 54 fermata, stiamo compiendo dicevo, un percorso, un po' lentamente permettetemi di dirlo, e ce ne accorgiamo di quanto sia stato lento questo percorso proprio in questi momenti quando si decide dobbiamo dare le munizioni all'Ucraina, dobbiamo sostenere l'Ucraina se non c'è un sistema di difesa anche un'industria della difesa meglio coordinata che sia parte di un disegno europeo certamente è più difficile fare politica estera dicevano nell'Ottocento non si fa politica estera se non si batte bandiera all'epoca Battere bandiera significava avere flotte che nel mondo potessero affermare la presenza di un paese. E se vogliamo affermare la nostra presenza anche e soprattutto come portatori di pace, e qua pensiamo, io penso alla missione Alte in Bosnia e Herzegovina, che è una missione tutta europea, avere una difesa comune non significa trasformare l'Europa in una sorta di realtà guerra fondaia. Significa avere un'Europa protagonista della politica, portatrice di pace. Perché chi conosce poi anche il mondo militare sa che se c'è qualcuno che non è guerra fondaia è proprio il militare. Ma serve un'Europa che possa accelerare i tempi per avere un'unica politica estera, che possa prendere delle decisioni. Allora dobbiamo domandarci quali riforme fare. Il voto all'unanimità è utile o non è utile per avere un'Europa politicamente più forte? Io credo che si debba procedere a qualche cambiamento. E guardando anche i più giovani fra di voi, Penso che l'Europa, per fare delle scelte politiche, debba anche rafforzare la sua istituzione democratica, che è il Parlamento europeo. È l'unico Parlamento al mondo quasi che, per esempio, non ha il potere di iniziativa legislativa. E questo non va nella direzione di rafforzare la democrazia all'interno della Unione Europea. I rappresentanti dei popoli europei devono avere il diritto, in nome e per conto dei loro elettori, di presentare delle proposte legislative, che non possono essere le proposte legislative una prerogativa praticamente assoluta, sì c'è quella delle iniziative popolari, ma è talmente complicato, prerogativa assoluta della Commissione Europea perché l'unico rappresentante elettivo è il Parlamento. E allora è vero che Lisbona ha fatto compiere un passo in avanti al Parlamento, ma bisogna continuare quel percorso. Percorso che deve vedere l'Europa certamente protagonista di scelte politiche, con l'Italia che deve essere protagonista. Tante volte io sento lamentele sul ruolo dell'Italia, ma contiamo poco. Beh, se si vuole contare bisogna lavorare di più, bisogna essere più presenti, bisogna essere più attivi anche nelle istituzioni 
comunitarie, perché l'Europa siamo noi, abbiamo il diritto e il dovere di contare di più in Europa, non possiamo lamentarci se gli altri contano di più, dobbiamo farci valere, ma battere i pugni sul tavolo non serve, bisogna per contare essere credibili, seri, affidabili, responsabili e fare delle proposte, perché discutere anche dei contenuti delle scelte europee non significa essere anti-europei, è vero l'esatto contrario, più si discute più si è europeisti perché si vuole partecipare alla costruzione di un progetto comune, ma se stiamo discutendo in questa fase per esempio del patto di stabilità e crescita, se diciamo che il patto di stabilità e crescita nuovo così come proposto dalla Commissione rappresenta certamente un passo in avanti però credo che dovrebbe essere aggiustato magari escludendo dal conto le spese per la transizione ecologica le spese per il PNRR le spese che vengono fatte magari per sostenere l'Ucraina. Sono tutte scelte dettate da politiche generali che vanno al di là della posizione di un singolo Paese e dell'economia di un singolo Paese. Quindi riflettiamo, discutiamo, faccio un esempio perché è quello di più stretta attualità, potremmo parlare della difesa europea e c'è qualcuno che dice ah no ma la Nato, ma la difesa europea non sarebbe un'alternativa alla Nato. La difesa europea sarebbe rafforzare la presenza europea all'interno della Nato per dare un contributo maggiore. Io ho sempre insistito sulla necessità, avendo dedicato la stragrande maggioranza della mia vita politica alle istituzioni comunitarie, della necessità di avere sempre più italiani a Bruxelles. Perché gli italiani possono dare un grande contributo, non lo facciamo abbastanza, dobbiamo farlo ancora di più. Contare di più in Europa significa avere più idee, più proposte, più partecipazione. Non è vero neanche che gli italiani sono esclusi, io sono diventato Presidente del Parlamento europeo, nessuno mi ha escluso, mi hanno votato non solo tanto gli italiani perché sennò non sarei stato eletto. Quindi vuol dire che se si vuole essere protagonisti in Europa, e non ho mai rinunciato alla mia identità di italiano, ecco, rinunciare significa poi essere costretti a lamentarsi degli altri, l'asse franco-tedesco. Eh, mettiamocela tutta per contare di più. C'è bisogno anche in Europa di più Italia. Dobbiamo farci ascoltare. Perché l'Europa siamo noi, l'Europa deve essere la sintesi di tutto ciò che c'è nel nostro continente. Culture e identità anche diverse, lingue diverse. Negli Stati Uniti è più facile costruire gli Stati Uniti d'America che gli Stati Uniti d'Europa, eppure ci hanno messo cent'anni. Noi abbiamo delle identità delle, talmente forti, ciascuno di noi, che poi mettere tutto in comune è sempre complicato però credo che valga la pena farlo perché poi non dobbiamo neanche considerare l'Europa come se fosse il palazzo di Berlemont il cuore dell'Europa il cuore dell'Europa sono quasi mezzo miliardo di donne e uomini che vivono in Europa. Confondere la burocrazia con l'Europa è un grave errore. La burocrazia è al servizio di mezzo miliardo di persone e non viceversa. E qui è la politica che deve avere il coraggio e la forza di imporsi, di assumersi delle responsabilità, dare delle direttive, dare delle linee guida alla burocrazia che deve applicare le scelte politiche per questo insisto sulla necessità di un'Europa più democratica con più poteri al Parlamento europeo 
ma non lo dico soltanto perché sono stato Presidente del Parlamento europeo, perché ne sono assolutamente convinto, perché così i popoli si sentono più rappresentati nelle istituzioni comunitarie, nella vita quotidiana. E poi ai tanti ragazzi che frequentano i corsi di questa magnifica realtà, siamo fieri di ospitarla in Italia, grazie per quello che fate, grazie anche poi alle nostre amministrazioni che contribuiscono al mantenimento di una realtà culturale formativa così importante che permette di formare nuove generazioni, manager esperti, parlavamo prima anche di manager che si formeranno in provenienza dai Balcani, noi vogliamo che questi paesi facciano parte dell'Unione Europea, siamo favorevoli all'ingresso dell'Ucraina ma siamo favorevoli anche all'ingresso dei paesi dei Balcani occidentali che sono candidati ad essere parte della Unione Europea perché altrimenti rischiamo di lasciare popoli che hanno comunque una visione e una tradizione comune alla nostra in, sotto l'influenza di altre realtà che non hanno lo stesso minimo comune denominatore. Perché dico questo? Perché c'è qualche cosa che ci lega. Che cosa lega un polacco a un italiano, un maltese a uno svedese? Eh, ci sono secoli di storia, anche di lotte, di confronti, però ci sono tanti di quegli elementi in comune che nel momento in cui si riflette sullo stato dell'arte, quindi sullo stato dell'Unione, non possono essere dimenticati. La nostra identità non può essere dimenticata. E credere e rafforzare la propria identità, credere e rafforzare la propria cultura, significa non chiudersi agli altri, ma significa aprirsi agli altri, perché più si è convinti di ciò che si è, più si è disposti al dialogo. E per questo dico che insieme dobbiamo anche affrontare la grande questione delle migrazioni. È un tema storico, non è soltanto un fatto di cronaca, è soltanto un'Europa unita, che ha un idem sentire, può svolgere un ruolo importante anche nel continente africano, perché non è soltanto una questione di ordine pubblico, quella dell'immigrazione, sì, in alcuni casi lo è anche, ma è una questione di una visione strategica. Come l'Europa vuole rapportarsi con il continente che ha di fronte? Con quali lenti vuole guardare all'Africa? E dobbiamo guardare a tutti assieme, non con le lenti dei colonizzatori, ma con le lenti degli africani, per rafforzare un'amicizia. Loro aspettano l'Europa come l'aspettano in Sud America, perché abbiamo dei legami talmente forti che non possiamo dimenticare, ma lo dobbiamo fare come Europa. E ogni Stato europeo deve dare il suo contributo per questo progetto, per risolvere le grandi questioni storiche, perché altrimenti fare un bilancio sul ruolo della Commissione, sul ruolo del Parlamento, il ruolo del Consiglio, sarebbe limitante. Dobbiamo guardare come insieme possiamo affrontare le grandi sfide del presente e del futuro. La lotta al cambiamento climatico, ma combinarla con la tutela della natura imprenditoriale dell'europeo. Perché se ci sono 24 milioni di imprese piccole e medie in Europa, vuol dire che anche questa vocazione all'uomo Faber c'è in Europa. Quindi dobbiamo tenere conto anche di questo. Ecco un altro elemento in comune. Come c'è naturalmente un elemento comune storico, e non lo dico perché ho la sindrome del sacrestano, ma le comuni radici cristiane, giudaico-cristiane, sono parte della nostra identità europea, indipendentemente, indipendentemente dal fatto di essere credenti o meno. Benedetto Croce diceva non possiamo non dirci cristiani, perché la nostra identità, la nostra cultura, come il diritto romano, 
è parte della nostra identità culturale, della gran parte dell'Europa. Ecco, ci sono talmente tante cose che ci uniscono. Siamo nella patria di Dante Alighieri, ma Dante Alighieri era solo fiorentino o era anche italiano? Era solo fiorentino italiano o era anche europeo? La Divina Commedia non sarebbe stata tradotta in tante lingue se il suo pensiero andasse al di là. E d'altronde è stato uno fra i primi a parlare di Europa, anche da un punto di vista politico. Andremo a affrontare una volta che fece un dibattito proprio su Dante europeista. Con eh, all'epoca era l'attuale presidente dell'ABI Antonio Patuelli. Lo facevamo a Ravenna perché lì è sepolto Dante, ma affrontammo questo tema. Eh, ma i grandi, le grandi cattedrali sono patrimonio di ogni singola nazione o sono patrimonio di tutta l'Europa? Cervantes è patrimonio spagnolo o patrimonio di tutti quanti noi? Mozart è patrimonio di chi è di madrelingua tedesca o è patrimonio di tutti? Beethoven è patrimonio di chi è di madrelingua tedesca o è di tutti? Verdi è patrimonio solo italiano o è patrimonio di tutti? Potremmo stare qui ad elencare decine e decine di artisti, di poeti, di scrittori, di geni. Enrico Fermi, grande scienziato, è patrimonio solo italiano o è patrimonio anche europeo? Madame Curie è patrimonio del francofono o è un patrimonio di tutti? Ecco, vedete quanta, quanta storia, quanta identità comune c'è. Non dovrei citare per ogni paese una figura importante, ma è come se l'avessi fatto. Ecco, vedete, questa è la nostra identità. Siamo l'unico continente al mondo, perché contano anche i valori, dove non esiste la pena di morte. Siamo l'unico continente al mondo dove neanche le istituzioni più forti possono arrogarsi il diritto di togliere la vita ad un essere umano, anche al peggiore, perché anche il peggiore, fino al momento in cui lascia questa vita, ha il diritto di cambiare e di redimersi. Anche il peggiore può essere utile alla società. Vedete, significa che c'è un'identità valoriale, il rispetto della persona, la centralità della persona. Questa è l'Europa nella quale io credo, nella quale credo sia giusto credere, credo che questi valori noi abbiamo il dovere di trasmetterli ai nostri figli. Non è solo politica, è anche un'identità io insisto in questo momento di sbandamento generale, fare riferimento ai valori è sempre importante perché una società se cade a causa di fattori esterni, se crede in valori profondi è in grado di rialzarsi, come ciascuno di noi, perché quello che hai dentro è più forte anche dei muscoli che hai. Perché la testa, le idee, i valori, la Divina Commedia non è soltanto la fotografia dell'inferno, del purgatore e del paradiso. È un modo di concepire la vita, ispirata a valori. Dante Alighieri si ispirava a valori. Vedete, questo è cito Dante perché a me piace il Dante europeo. Quindi in questa sede voglio ricordare proprio questo aspetto. Potremmo parlare ore e ore, quindi concludo questo intervento sullo Stato dell'Unione. Io sono ottimista e guardo con speranza al futuro, proprio perché c'è questo idem sentire, c'è questo sottofondo comune di millenni di storia. Voglio ricordare un episodio 
che è emblematico e lo feci celebrando all'epoca ero presidente del Parlamento europeo il, la firma la commemorazione della firma del Trattato di Roma era la storia del primo imperatore ispanico Traiano, figlio di un senatore ispanico e lui chiese al padre, dice ma può un ispanico diventare imperatore romano? Il padre gli rispose sì perché Roma non è una città, Roma sono le sue leggi, Roma sono le sue infrastrutture, Roma è la sua storia, Roma è un grande ideale. Ecco, l'Europa è un po' la stessa cosa, non sono soltanto gli uffici di Bruxelles, non è soltanto la burocrazia per quanto utile. L'Europa è un grande ideale perché è la nostra identità, è la nostra storia e noi italiani che abbiamo l'onore e la, la fortuna di essere eredi di grandi civiltà, custodi della memoria di secoli. E ricordavamo con il sindaco le origini di Fiesole, pre-romaniche. E quindi anche quelle antiche civiltà, etrusche, fenici, sono parte di questa nostra identità. Io credo che valga la pena, sentendoci tutti europei, di continuare a lavorare per un'Europa politicamente più forte, che rappresenti anche la nostra identità che sia pronta ad ospitare, come d'altronde faceva l'antica Roma, proprio perché era forte della propria identità. Chi ha un'identità debole chiude le porte e si spaventa di tutto. E questo ve lo dice uno che è figlio di militare, la prima cosa che gli è stata insegnata a casa era amare e rispettare la bandiera. Quindi la mia italianità certamente è fortissima, ma proprio perché sono italiano e sono fiero di essere italiano, mi sento un cittadino europeo, perché il cuore della nostra civiltà, della nostra identità, alberga anche nella mia patria, come alberga nella patria di tanti di voi. Ecco, questo significa, secondo me, essere europei. Se crediamo in tutte queste cose, allora possiamo dirci ottimisti. Grazie.
Doing PhD at SPS is, um, I think first of all, what is this to be doing a PhD? I think this is a good question to ask. For me personally, doing a PhD, it's a, it's a time in your life or it's a moment, it's a possibility to change your identity. This is because doing a PhD is probably one of the very few environments or possibilities or professional opportunities to have you work on something that you are really interested in yourself and that is not mandated by a supervisor. It changes your identity in, 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 in a way because it makes you think and ponder over what it is that really interests you, what it is that you really want to do, and not only substantively speaking, but also um, how you want to work, you know? What are the methods that you want to, that you want to use in your work? I think doing PhD is a very challenging experience. And I think that the EUI or SPS, what it provides you with is a fantastic community that you can, that you can, that is very supportive of this process, of this process of you finding yourself. People are always moving here. We don't have tenure, so the faculty is always circulating and every year we get a new cohort of fresh doctoral researchers from all over Europe. Everybody's starting new. It's a lot of fun. And here at the EUI, writing a dissertation is not a lonely journey. You have your cohort, you have your supervisor. Many supervisors meet together with their supervisees in groups. You have requirements that everybody is doing at the same time. So you have a lot of company and a lot of support. It's, this is a very supportive community for writing a doctoral dissertation. Yes, student life at EY, well, it's a, it's, it's a fantastic life. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. Um, yes, we are, you know, we live here together in this wonderful city. Um, and only that, you know, we, we are at this beautiful university where we get all of these opportunities to, you know, fantastic library and resources, etc. We also spend a lot of time with each other after work. Um, so we go out a lot. Um, people do loads of different sports, you know, people would go biking or hiking or... Um, oh, I recently started playing tennis, for instance, because there are tennis courts right, uh, right next to the EY. So there is a lot of opportunity for leisure, for spending time together, for, you know, which is also conducive um, for us to come up with research ideas. You know, many people here start working together on projects um, and it's fantastic also to see. So yeah, student life is amazing. <laughs> A new PhD student should expect Coming into our department is first of all a very warm welcome. We have a September program where we introduce the incoming researchers to the different faculty research areas. The EUI provides Italian courses. We have social events and we have some uh, courses that get people ready for their first semester. So introduction to some of the computer programs they'll be using. I would recommend Anyone who is curious and has lust for knowledge, I would rec recommend them to do a PhD at UI because I think it gives you just all necessary ingredients for you to try yourself out and see whether this is something for you. Precisely thanks to the you know, funding that you receive, great community, just you know, wonderful life that gives you this mental space to, to think about your interests and, and work, work on your project of interest.
welcome to everybody to this uh, panel uh, on the Global Thank Gateway, um, which is the new instrument that the European Union has proposed in order to, uh, let's say, create a new way to uh, deal with the countries of the Global South, let's say that in this way. So a uh, policy, a political, and uh, uh, economic tool in order to interact. The panel of today, I'll be shorter because now time has been a bit affected by the previous uh, uh, discussion with the I Italian Foreign Ministry. Now, I'm Stefano Manservisi, I'm part-time professor here at the School of Transnational Governance at the European European Institute, uh, and uh, I'm also former Director General at the European Commission under different uh, capacities. The panel is extremely rich. I will be uh, helped by Elizabeth Maloba, Policy Leader Fellow of the European University Institute, from Kenya, so therefore a relevant voice uh, talking about Africa. And the panel is composed by Rita Bissonot, who is the director of uh, the UNESCO Leibniz Office uh, with the, to the African Union Commission, uh, to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and to the government of the Republic of Ethiopia. Thank you, Rita, to be here. Then uh, we have Emanuela de Rey, uh, EU Special Representative uh, for the European Union in the Sahel and former Minister uh, uh, of uh, Italian Government uh, and specializing in international cooperation. Then we have Rainudur Elit Arnadotir, forgive me for the pronunciation because obviously <laughs> it's not that easy, which is the director of the OECD Development Center, which is particularly important because it's going beyond Europe, uh, is involving other big actors. It also is almost a unique place where also big countries of the global south are sitting. So this is particularly important. And then Pil Vitosti, the recently newly appointed director of the European Training Foundation and former member of the Finnish parliament. So rich panel, different point of view. Allow me to say a couple of things mm, in order to put the global gateway in the, in, the, in, in the context. They say, after all, President Juncker, already in 2017, you know, felt that it was necessary to change the way in which the European Union was doing the development activity, and development business, you know, changing, you know, the, the, the environment, the landscape, the uh, integrality of the challenge as, the, as underlined in the SDGs, in the Agenda 2030, and therefore launching the big idea to have a sort of external investment plan involving systematically private sector. Involving private sector as a, the only way to turn from a donorship approach to a partnership through doing business together building jobs, building sustainable jobs. And therefore it launched this, uh, let's say, approach, which was a sort of first step towards a radical change in our paradigm. But then President von der Leyen uh, went even further because uh, uh, she put first this as a, one of the key challenges of the new union, of the new commission, uh, to a point also to change radically the language. More than talking about development, let's talk about partnership you know, and putting partnership very high in the, in the, in the policy formulation of the, mm. the European Union. And, uh, and, and therefore, underlining that this is strategic, it's not just a question of words, it's a question of really sitting with our partners and decide together what to do, involving all the actors from civil society to private sector to public institutions. But then obviously, you know, this message which was uh, partnership to decide and Team Europe to, de to deliver. Team Europe seems a slogan, but in reality is crucially important because it's a way to reduce the fragmentation of uh, European external action, which uh, every member state is entitled to run, but that's to close this. So Team Europe presenting Europe in much more, let's say, united way, also to the benefit of our part. But then suddenly the environment is also changing. We, we are in a world which is called a poly-crisis based world, you know, in which every instrument could be weaponized or could be seen as being a way you know, to, to have different objectives. Therefore, even the Global Gateway has been seen a bit as a way to respond to China Belt and Road. Actually, I was also a bit there when the, the, the discussion was there. It's, it's not like this. It's not like this. It's not a mechanic response. But still, you know, people are also perceiving this, and uh, the new uh, environment in the world is changing a bit uh, the kind of challenge that the European Union has uh, uh, through the partnership approach and the global gateway as an instrument. Now, 
if these are, let's say, the, the new, uh, let's say, context, the new uh, uh, benchmark in order to have this, this kind of discussion, I would like now to ask, you know, from the perspective of our panelists, you know, how they see, let's say, this instrument uh, in this new environment. What are the assets? What are maybe uh, the weaknesses? What are the the assets and how we can work together in order to make this a solid contribution, not only to do politics, but also to address a real problem of ordinary people, which is still poverty, access to energy, you know, access to, a decent, to decent jobs, and to be partners to build a better world, after all. This is a bit the idea. Now, I would like to start with Rita. Rita, you are the one working permanently in Africa, you know, and with the Africans, the African uh, Union Commission, with the uh, UNECA, and with uh, the uh, Ethiopian government. How do you see this from, uh, let's say, a ground point of view and in your talks with uh, these authorities and these interlocutors? Please, Rita. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting UNESCO to be here this morning. And thank you to the European University Institute and everybody for being here. I think, first of all, I would like to say that when Her Excellency von der Leyen uh, first came in, her first speech was that Africa would be the key partner building the world that we want to live in. And I think this is so important because we should not forget by, by the year 2030, that is, by the, by the time that the SDGs are going to close, Africans will be about one-third of the working population in the whole world. And this is very, very important. And this is why today Africa is seen as the continent of the future. And for us at UNESCO, we have two global priorities, Africa and the second one being gender equality. I think Afro-pessimism has now given way to Afro-optimism. And, the, and there are two reasons why, which justify this change. The first one is that Africa has abundant natural resources and the youth, the youth of the population. Right now, the youth of the population comprises about 70% under the age of 35, and this is why in the next 20 years or so, Africans will comprise a big chunk of the working population in the world. But of course, the many, Africa faces many challenges, and, the, and for this, development is perceived differently from others. Africans perceive these challenges as opportunities and have come to realize that change that they seek can only come from the resources available on the continent but they are conscious of the initiatives of international partners, which are very, very important. And I think uh, we can see that even though many do not hesitate to compare Africa as the most beautiful woman in the world, but can it be otherwise? Because Africa has immense agricultural, mining, and energy resources. However, and this is why we have so many countries proposing to establish multi-sectoral partnerships which can help the different, uh, the different populations out of poverty. Even though one chooses one's friends, but we do not choose our brothers, we do not choose our sisters, as we used to say. This is a very African, uh, this is a very African uh, expression. And I think this is what maybe we can say one way of describing the secular relation that Africa has with Europe. Because this cooperation is, has been imposed, we might say, by both continents, by both Africa and Europe, or, or Europe and, and, and Africa. And as you know, sometimes there are feelings <coughs> of distrust that, come, that have been there. But we have to work together, we have to nourish ourselves, we have to enrich ourselves with these differences learn to share our experiences, learn to support each other, learn to accompany each other, but at the end, look in the same direction, which is the management of global governance. I think Europe has done a lot for Africa. Even though today, Af Europe continues to do much for Africa, for example, through the European Development Fund, through the channels of the national indicative programs and regional indicative programs, as well as other bilateral assistance, there has been considerable contribution that the European Union has done to Africa, both in good times, both in bad. In the area of peace and security, Europe also is one of the most active partners, especially, for example, I take peace keeping operations in Darfur, in Somalia, in South Sudan. 
and we know that they have, uh, and we know that there has been the comprehensive peace agreement, for example, in Central Republic of, of Africa, thanks to the help of the European Union. Of course, Europe, uh, the EU's support for many elections in Africa remains exemplary, demonstrating the commitment to the democratic process of, of Africa. So we, I think the European support for pan-African institutions is very, very commendable, as has been illustrated by the 55 million euros that have been granted to the African Union Commission for capacity building, for capacity building sorry, of, of Africans. However, even though we can see this support, aid is not always visible. And this makes us ask a question. Where has maybe the European not completely achieved its mission in Africa? In the sense that Africans are still poor. We have not, I mean, the European, has, the, sorry, the European Union has not been able to lift the African continent out of its poverty in spite of the very close relationships that exist between the two continents. And this is why today many youths in Africa challenge the <coughs> European leaders, leaders, for despite the immense contributions that the U European Union has granted to Africa, there are still misunderstandings, misunderstandings in the relationships that exist between the two continents. African youth and the African society civil society find it difficult sometimes to totally understand the attitude towards them. And this is mostly related in the areas of immigration, the issuance of visas, the reception of African students in European universities, universal jurisdiction, and the conditionality of aid to the respect of human rights and the virtues of democracy, the support given to certain regimes, and the policy that comes from Europe on the double standards. And this is something that needs really to be discussed. I'll stop here, and if I have other questions, I'll talk about what, what can be done. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Rita. Now, Emanuela, you, you are working intensively in one of the most difficult areas, you know, where, let's say, Europe is not necessarily that popular. You know, how you feel equipped better with a new narrative on partnership and with a, a stronger envelope, which is up to 300 billion after all, but in particular, mobilizing investment and creating jobs. Please. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, well, when we talk about a global gateway, yes, it is an instrument, no doubt, both at political and economic level. And uh, I am uh, very happy to say that uh, since the beginning, these 300 billion uh, uh, euros have been divided into two parts, and 150, more or less, go to Africa, which is very good news, because it was about time we realized how important Africa is uh, and uh, how important it is to have a proper strategy for, uh, for Africa, not only react to emergencies and uh, provide uh, uh, humanitarian aid, which we do all the time, especially in my area, which is the Sahel, and, of course, uh, an area in which, uh, as you can, you can imagine, there are uh, very serious ongoing going crisis from all aspects, from security aspects to food, food security, um, climate change, and other very serious uh, uh, challenges. Well, the Global Gateway, I would say, uh, is definitely uh, the pillar of our action in Africa. It has become, at least, the pillar of our Africa, uh, African uh, policy and African uh, approach because uh, uh, it has uh, provided a serious instrument, not only in financial terms, which was absolutely necessary, because one of the things that emerges in all our discussions with the Africans is always the need to organize better our financial institutions and our uh, financial architecture, but also is uh, the demonstration, the global gateway, that we have acquired a certain awareness on what is actually needed to make the, con the, the continent advance, considering that, as uh, Sannino, the, the Secretary General of uh, the Standard Action, said yesterday, because we had yesterday a meeting uh, between uh, the um, po poly um, Political and Security Committee of Europe and the Political and Security Committee of the African Union, 
He said uh, it, is, it, it is an instrument to grow together. But what does it mean to grow together? Change our policy, especially in economic terms. Try to find uh, new uh, investments, especially in the field of infrastructure. I have to say that since I was vice minister, the Africans were always advocating for this. So please provide infrastructure. Please provide solid solutions and permanent solutions to come out of the, uh, of the typical, uh, let's say, short and medium term attitude to transform our approach into a medium-term and long-term approach, which is much needed considering that our future is together. Well, of course, uh, the, 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 the European Union will also benefit very much from this instrument because, for instance, regarding uh, our position, this instrument will contribute to the G7 uh, engagement in, uh, in the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, meaning that it is a way of involving even more, even more the, let's say, leading part of the world with the part that is actually striving to be become uh, more present, especially in the global debate, as I often say, because consider that great part of the African continent is excluded virtually from the global debate. They are participating, but in terms of their uh, effectiveness, apart from there are, when there are votes in the, Euro, in, the, in the United Nations, unfortunately, they are not particularly uh, consistent uh, in terms of their presence, because their arguments are incredibly strong, but there is little room for them. So I think that uh, one key word would be that uh, the, the Global Gateway allows us to accelerate. There is a strong need, and here I come to the sentiment against the European Union, in, especially in the new generations in Africa, which will be the leading generations also for Europe in the future, because uh, uh, especially in the Sahel, the average age is around 18, and uh, there is a, a demographic growth which is really going very fast, constituting a very important human capital that is, that, that is a very important resource for us. Well, uh, the Global Gateway allows us to accelerate. The youth in Africa wants to an acceleration of history. We are trying to give a response to this demand. It's not easy, but we are starting. And when I talk about accelerating, it means that we are accelerating investments, for instance, especially for quality infrastructure. And this is also very important because low and middle in income countries are not selling out. Africa is not selling out. Africa wants quality and especially wants quality to improve it, the, the portability of its production and also to become more competitive at a global level. I said global many times, but it seems that it is actually the element in common with all the arguments. Going uh, fast uh, in, in the analysis, I can tell you that, of course, we have mentioned partnership. Of course, partnership is the key word today, but it was considered that a very strong uh, cultural revolution. We arrived at the, 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 the point of calling the countries of Africa partners after having been calling them uh, third countries, uh, developing countries. So today we have the duty to transform this partnership in a political concept that really um, is consistent. I can tell you that for the European Union, the Global Gateway, while it helps the countries of, uh, the, the, of Africa grow, it is a, a very important opportunity because it allows the European Union to expand uh, and maintain also its its geopolitical position, especially now in this new multipolar polar world, in which openness and, uh, is absolutely necessary, but in what way the global weight, gateway is, uh, is offering uh, an opportunity. I just want to tell you also that for the European Union, this is also a question of preparedness. We know that uh, this is double-folded because it goes also for the Africans. Diversify supply chains, incorporate new economic sectors, in particular the private sector. I could make a list of interesting projects that are already ongoing with the, with the um, Global Gateway in the Sahel, but I just want to mention one in line with the issue of, the, of, uh, of climate, which is the Great Green Wall, which is a sort of a big belt, a green belt that will uh, cross the Sahel, uh, favoring uh, the contrast uh, um, uh, to, uh, global, uh, to climate change uh, challenges. It's just one of them, but 
What I want to say is that uh, the success of the Global Gateway is, the fact that it is in the fact that, that it supports an holistic economic transition. It was much needed because economic, uh, even when I talk about economy regarding the Sahel, it's very difficult for me to pass messages because people think, where, where, are, where is the economy? Where, are, where is the opportunity for investment? Very difficult to attract uh, foreign direct investments. Very difficult to convince the private sector. Well, the Global Gateway gives us this opportunity, especially, as I said, in the medium and long term uh, period. To conclude, I just want to tell you one thing. If we think that this is easy, as a process is not. In the, yesterday morning, I was uh, talking to Commissioner Bancole from the African Union, and he was very, very direct. And this is exactly what we want in our exchange, to be frank, to be direct, because we are partners. And he was saying clearly uh, that Africa has ambitions, very strong ambitions. We know that. But of course, we, we don't understand what it means sometimes, because we speak another language still. And of course, the, the kind of uh, points of reference they are bringing about are still far for, for us. How can we invest tomorrow 30 billion euro for uh, an infrastructure project? Well, with the Global Gateway, now we are obliged to reflect on this and give concrete responses. So the most important thing for the Global Gateway, I would say, is that it actually uh, helps us to uh, create a, a vision and, and a plan, overcome the differences that Bancole was uh, uh, highlighting yesterday in a very harsh way, because I told you, uh, in, in a sense, the criticism is very harsh in terms of uh, where were we when others were already advancing in proposals that have demonstrated not to be so successful, but have been made. And now we are there, so we are called to actually give precise responses. And what is the principle that we want uh, um, to, to refer to as an, insp an inspiration for all these policies of the Global Gateway? Ownership. This is the most important thing. I remember yesterday, when talking to Bancole, he was saying, thank you very much for mentioning ownership, because uh, I was mentioning it, of course, because I think it's a, an inspiring principle. But he said, this is exactly what we have to aim at, through the ambition, shared ambition, growing together, but uh, respecting ownership. And this is exactly my dream. I hope that we will attain ownership one day. The Global Gateway, it's a good instrument for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Now, uh, I think uh, just uh, you, you made reference to a point which is crucial, the trade uh, and commercial yeah. aspect. You know, I think I would like to recall to everybody that not only Africa is quite marginal in international trade, but the intra-African trade is just 3% mm -hmm. of all the trade of the African country. It means, therefore, that uh, their project, the African project of setting up a pan-African internal market, let's say, single market, what is called the Pan-Africa area of free trade, uh, it's uh, particularly important. And the Global Gateway is supposed to be a way to uh, uh, interconnect physically and virtually, you know, physical interconnection, digital interconnection, and say also policy interconnection. Now, this is at least the ambition of the European Union, but looking now from, they say, a bit outside the European Union, you know, the OECD Development Center, you know, what, what is the vision? I mean, to what extent uh, this way of uh, doing development through partnership for investment and with investment with the private sector could, uh, uh, let's say, really benefit to the global development agenda? Please, Raga. Thank you, Stefano, and, and like my fellow panelists, I want to thank uh, for the invitation to be here. It's an extremely interesting venue. Um, I come from the OECD Development Center, which, as Stefano said, uh, goes beyond Europe. We have 53 members, 25 OECD countries, and 28 non-OECD countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And the EU is a, is a, a, a very strong and, and valued partner of the work that we are doing. And Regarding the, the global gateway and, and just the, if we look at the status of, the, of where we are in terms of development, we all know about the, the multi-crisis, the polycrisis, as, as Stefano mentioned. And, and the need, the problems are simply too big for any one actor to be able to solve it. So partnership in the, in the global gateway, the emphasis on partnership and the, the European Union's emphasis on that is a key component in finding a solution, in, in, in my opinion, because we, we see uh, where we are, the crisis. We, we, every, all of this has compounded the, the in, effects, really, 
on the most vulnerable countries. We see the SDG financing um, gap that has widened, and especially in Africa, if we look at that, uh, the, the proportion of the national commitments in the, in the budget is 21%, is while it's 9% usually in the, around that in the, in the uh, uh, more developed countries. And what is, and we've been talking about investment, what is uh, crucial to have and has been pointed out is that investment is not flowing into emerging and develop, developing uh, economies. In, in high income countries, it grew uh, about roughly or a little more than 8% in 21, while it shrunk in the least developed countries by the same or even more, uh, nearly 9% in 2021, which, and it was the third year that this, is, this was, was happening. So the state of play, the status of where we are when we enter into this, uh, this discussion shows us that uh, we need to shift towards partnerships. We simply need to do more, we need to uh, do it better, and we need to innovate. And I, I think that the, the Global Gateway is an attempt by the European Union to innovate. And we have seen the, the EU been, being uh, willing and, and a pioneer in that, for example, with the development and transition that you know well, uh, Stefano, which is an approach promoted by the EU, UN ECLAC, and, and the OECD Development Center, focusing on or calling for a different approach to development beyond, um, beyond having the GDP be the, the only indicator of development, aligning it with the SDGs, and promoting sort of inclusive, uh, inclusive um, international cooperation. And with the, with the, with the uh, global gateways, uh, with the global gateway, the EU has, has focused on the investment side of, of development, um, helping to, prom to promote uh, global development in the context of digital and, and uh, green transition, which, is, which are the, the projects in front of us. So in that, that respect, uh, I think it is, is spot on in where we are going. And just to go back to the, the investment, it's been, it's been uh, mentioned here. Why is it so crucial? Well, um, the ODA increase um, of 35 billion US dollars in 20, between 20 and, and 21 was welcomed, but it's not enough. And it's not enough to meet today's global challenges, the ones that we've been discussing. And it needs to be a catalyst uh, for additional contributions, especially and particularly from the private sector. And that is also one of the, the Global Gateway's emphasis. And I mentioned the, the fiscally constrained countries in Africa mostly, they are especially vulnerable to this. And what has also been pointed out, the, um, the, the fact that we have about 375 million young people uh, entering the, label, the African label market uh, by the year 2035. And 2035, ladies and gentlemen, is in 15 minutes, if we look at it in, in, in real terms. Um, so they will be needing quality jobs, and those quality jobs will need investment. And having said all that, I must say that investment does not necessarily or automatically lead to impact. So we need to be strategic about what sort of investment. We need to, to have it uh, context tailored and made, uh, made uh, specific to the opportunities in each region. And the regions are, are different. Let me just give you a couple of example, uh, examples. If we look at the Latin American Caribbean region, um, there is significant potential for green development there. Um, in our Latin American economic outlook for, for 2022, we were discussing the green transition in, in, in specifics, and we saw that the opportunities, if we do it right, of, of, of taking the green transition forward in that region could lead to the creation of over 10% more jobs than if not. But we need to do it right, and in order to do it right, we need to 
be open for the opportunities of the green transition. We need to make sure that, that the investment uh, drives, uh, drives uh, in, in that region where 60% of the, the workforce is informal. <clears throat> so we need to have policies that takes that into a, a consideration, whether we like it or not. Uh, in Africa, <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned the improved market uh, integration and, the, and the, the stronger value chains within the region. Those are opportunities uh, that can secure uh, better jobs and better uh, to, to get the, the benefits from the, from the investment. And there we go to infrastructure. We, we, we need to close the African infrastructure gap. And at the OCD, at the development center, or we, we, we started it at the development center, but it's a, it's a whole of house OECD uh, partnership with the Africa Union. Uh, and this was, was strongly advocated by uh, the former uh, chairman of the African Union, Maki, uh, President Maki Sall of, of Senegal, uh, to get the African voice at the table when we're evaluating risk, when we're evaluating uh, investment conditions. Um, so we are now in the process of creating an African investment observatory, a joint partnership with, between the OECD and the Africa Union Commission, where we are finding ways to uh, gather data and examine how we can measure uh, the, the, uh, the factors that, that uh, drive and, and inhibit investment from realizing, and particularly in, in, in infrastructure and the, the, the quality infrastructure that, that you mentioned that is so needed. As you can hear, I could go on for, for, for much longer, but I will stop here. Thank, thank you very much, Raga. Uh, I would like to recall, just for those which are interested, to have a bit more detail, you know. Uh, the first operation of Global Gateway has been uh, discussed with uh, the African Union during the EU-African uh, uh, Union Summit in February last year. You know, if you go uh, in the website of the Commission, etc., you'll have a list of, the, of this project, just to give you an idea. I would like to single out one, which is particularly important, to enable Africans to produce vaccines, for example, just to give you a bit the, the idea among many difficulties. So, African Union last year. But then in July, there will be the summit between the European Union and uh, uh, CELAC, meaning the group of South America and Caribbean state. Another moment to test what we are saying here, you know, to what extent this is a, a tool which is effective and to the service of a policy. So therefore, just a couple of information, because then you can have also more concrete ideas of what we are talking about. Now, Pivy, uh, creating jobs, private investment, etc. but it means also, let's say, employability, if I may say that in this way. Therefore, European Training Foundation, although so far vis-a-vis -vis third countries has been more focused on our neighborhood, which is part of the Global Gateway and Western Balkans, but, you know, from a systemic point of view, what, what's your point of view on this, uh, say, component, which may entail also a number of things which could be seen with less uh, favor in Europe, more mobility, for example, you know, more exchange among people. So, training in this uh, approach of the Global Gateway. Yeah, uh, thank you, Stefano. I think to a little bit perhaps also to entertain the audience, uh, as it was mentioned, I started three weeks ago as the director of the ETF. And I just found in my notes that when I had my interview for the position, the last one with the governing board last November, I had notes that looked like this for the interview. And the very first phrase here is global gateway. So it just <laughs> perhaps illustrates that it did have a meaning in my mind uh, for this position already before I joined and definitely before I prepared for this very panel. Uh, um, meaning of, um, of training, employability, uh, 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 education, lifelong learning. I think when you started in the panel, actually uh, the, you used the word asset. Uh, of the global gateway, and I think from the perspective of the European Training Foundation, one could perhaps approach three uh, elements. The first one would be the sort of long-term or ownership that was mentioned. The second one would be partnership, and the third one would be global approach. And if you may, I just uh, uh, open each three a little bit. 
perhaps before that saying for the audience that the European Training Foundation uh, is unique in that sense that it's the only European Union agency that actually works geographically uh, outside the Union countries, uh, currently with 28 countries, plus with a very special mandate also with the African Union, and I come to that a bit later. And then it has the thematic level on the uh, lifelong learning, human capital development, education and training. So it brings together the geographic and thematic uh, elements that I think are very much to the point uh, of certain parts of the uh, global gateway and definitely the policies of the Union currently. So from that experience, what means long-term or ownership? The EDF started in 1990s to actually bring the former uh, uh, socialist bloc countries to help and support their process in modernizing education and training systems so that they could then comply with the European Union. And what happened, we of course have had a very success, successful enlargement over the years. So that's the DNA. And that process has then brought ETF to work um, further, so further south, further east, Central uh, Asia, and also a little bit Africa. And I think the learning there really is that if you work long term in a systemic level with the decision makers locally, build those relationships, build your database and understanding what has uh, worked elsewhere, uh, you not only build trust uh, with the stakeholders, but you also have long term results. And of course, now it came to through it last spring, for instance, with Ukraine, where uh, ETF had been active for decades and, and was therefore able actually to bring the recognition of qualifications of Ukrainians. Uh, very quickly to the sort of uh, level of, uh, or to the understanding, to the sort of same uh, understanding in different countries of the Union where people came as, as refugees. So I think this, this principle of long-term involvement, which means always ownership, is really a key, and there the sort of experience of our organization really proves that it has worked, and that should be really a continuous principle with the Global Gateway. The second one, the partnerships. Um, I think we sometimes use the word partnership very lightly. It can be just an agreement or memorandum of understanding. But when it really starts to have a meaning, it's when it becomes a peer-to-peer -peer experiences, two-way streets. And here I would perhaps take the example from the African continent. Uh, we currently work something uh, called uh, African continent, uh, continent Qualification Framework, which is a similar approach, again, that the European Training Foundation has done in Europe. In other words, trying to bring the uh, vocational education qualifications uh, to the same framework so that they are recognizable country to country. I mean, we also know within the member states it's always not happening. It's not easy, but through that experience, one can also see what kind of frameworks can really bear fruit and, fruit and be then useful for, for instance, for the investment, because it's after all what you need is a skilled uh, labor force and qualification that you can understand and recognize. So it's a question of investment, it's a question of migration, it's really a question of countries working together, for instance, within African uh, Union. And uh, I must say, as a, as a sort of newcomer to the organization, I was quite impressed when I met the person who is in charge of this work uh, with the qualification framework in Africa because I think it's true partnership in a very deep level. It's not an institutional one, but it really goes down to help the people, which I think should always be remembered as our goal. From long-term and partnership, the third element, I think, with the global gateway that was perhaps now uh, already uh, mentioned a little bit by you, Stefano, is this global approach. It's, we talk a lot and, and we should talk a lot about Africa, but I think it's also very good that Europe has somehow understood itself as a global actor and, and is bringing its different policies together through global gateway to have the sort of global approach. And if I just give you an example from the field that I know the best, which is the education and training, there we perhaps some, sometimes a little bit falsely think that, oh, it's such an international or global field. It's not. We have developed our education and training systems typically nationally uh, based on actually nation state structures and therefore they are not talking to one another that well, we need these mod moderator uh, uh, instruments. And if we have global approach through the global gateway, we can also perhaps help to have certain structures that help us to uh, develop uh, global approaches in this field that actually are classically very national ones and where exchange of knowledge and exchange of experience 
truly doesn't take place because the practitioners actually work for the service of the, of the nation, national or regional, regional bodies. I stop here that we have a little time for interactions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm watching the red color <laughs> of speaking time. Well. But I think that the organizers should also forgive us because we have been a bit occupied by previous uh, important moments of discussion. I, I mean, I would like to uh, pass now the floor to Elizabeth, which is co-moderator, co of course, but uh, that she's also a young African leader. Yeah. And we've been speaking a lot about Africa, etc. Maybe from all what uh, the different panelists said, what, what you'd like to ask maybe them uh, some, a specific question on the basis of, uh, you know, what, what they expressed so far. Thank you. Uh, I'm not quite sure about young. <laughs> Always. Um, I think listening to, to all the various contributions and, and looking at my background, I come from a background where I work in multi-stakeholder processes and this involves a lot bringing civil society and private sector to the table. I, I hear a lot when I'm working in these processes about the asymmetrical relationship, about the demanding processes of collaboration and how bureaucratic and time consuming they can be, um, how difficult it is therefore to, to do anything effectively and deliver any impact, um, how difficult it is of course to access, especially if you are a local uh, African uh, organization as opposed to a European one. Um, so when it comes to ownership, um, it's easier if you're from the other side of a divide. How do we bring in the African um, private sector? How do we bring the African civil society to the table? How do we make it possible to collaborate within such an asymmetrically um, constituted partnership? And um, I mean, a lot more practical questions like, how do we build investor confidence? Because that's another big thing that, despite all our efforts and, and, and um, work in this area, uh, foreign investors still consider Africa a very risky destination and therefore either A, the capital doesn't come, or B, it comes at such a high rate, interest rate that many countries are now finding themselves with problems uh, with sovereign debt. So I think, I mean, I have a lot more questions, but as a starting point, I would like to hear probably from each of them from their own experience how we would address some of these um, issues. So, Rita, so there is an asymmetry. Partnership, yes, but there is an asymmetry. And second, you know, how... You know, to be credible, I mean, ownership, legitimacy, whatever, but how to be credible, in particular with the grassroots people, civil society, ordinary people. Rita. Thank you. I well, unfortunately, it should be short. Okay, because, I, you know, I will be very short. I think uh, that in Africa, we should stop talking about aid, but we should, as, as, in, as many people are talking, let us talk about cooperation. Let us talk about solidarity partnerships. Let us talk about shared values. Let us talk about mutual interests. It has to be owned by the African people. And this will shatter this dominance about development assistance that comes with the word aid. We have to evacuate this word aid. I think it is no longer about doing aid, it is no longer assistance, but is, it is establishing a mutual relationship that is based on reciprocal listening, ownership, accompanying and empowering our African communities. And I think this is what the Global Gateway brings, this renewed, this new paradigm where our voices as Africans are heard and we do not go into this trap is looking for problems with ready-made solutions coming from the West in the field of public aid. And I think this is the new narrative that Africa wants, acknowledging the needs, our needs as Africans, using our resources for sustainable development and building the capacity of our people. Thank you, Rita. Emanuela. Yes, uh, I have to say that probably the um, answer to the, the, the very important questions that have been posed 
is uh, the fact that um, we should acquire a whole of society approach. This is very much required by the African part, difficult to implement from, from our side of the European Union. Nevertheless, I have to say that there are two uh, elements. One is that there has never been so much attention towards Africa, and in particular, for instance, towards my region, the Sahel, uh, from the European Union as there is now. This means that there is an historical opportunity that we have to take, both as Europeans and Africans. This is why I always talk about this partnership as uh, becoming practically concrete. Uh, so all of, our, of, of society approach is uh, um, a sort of predicament. Nevertheless, of course, it's difficult for a number of reasons. Because, for instance, in the Sahel, there are impediments within society. It's very difficult for civil society uh, to act uh, in certain contexts. There are uh, restrictions on civil liberty. We cannot hide this. And also, of course, uh, it's very difficult for civil society to get organized. They have no funds. We are trying to do as much as possible. There are initiatives. Uh, the European Union is very much concentrated on, on uh, these initiatives. I have to say that Commissioner Urpilainen, and she's very much um, the com Commissioner of the European Union for Partnership. She's very much concentrated on, on the youth. We are trying to organize as many, uh, let's say, opportunities as possible for the youth to travel. We try to uh, create opportunities of discussion, also putting together different parts of society. Not easy. It is a process. The most important element I find is that we have initiated the process. Because until now, there was a stagnating situation that was really killing initiatives and will within society. So we can count on, on this, uh, uh, let's say, new, renewed energy, which is not only in renewable energy or hydrogen energy, but it's actually made of human capacity and human intelligence. And I think that we are in the right direction. Certainly, we need more Funds. I myself, I have created in support of my, of my uh, own office a group of, uh, of uh, young people who participate and consult me uh, from the, the countries of the Sahel. Uh, five ladies and five uh, gentlemen, young men, of course. And uh, uh, this is a way of demonstrating that we can do things. We are trying to make especially the civil society come out of the Indian reserve, as I always say. They are always put in, a, in an Indian reserve. They come out when we need to show them and to interact with them. No, they have to be mixed, especially to overcome this asymmetric uh, situation that you were talking about. It's not easy, again, not easy, but all together we can do it especially with these instruments. We have financial instruments absolutely needed, such as the Global Gateway. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Now, Aga, uh, fortunately, we have very little time. But, you know, in the USD Development Center, you have not only Europeans. No. There are also others. And, and there are other ways of saying we want to build partnerships. How you can see that in terms of comparing results, comparing effectiveness, you know, as a way also to, to qualify and to be credible? What, what is your taking away from this wider, uh, let's say, reality, which is the USD Development Center? I think there are two very important factors. It's the, what has also been discussed here, the partnership is not just a partnership. Partnership is having a dialogue with your partners, not coming to the table Be, we have to be willing to listen to uh, other views and then come together and, and try to find uh, ways forward. And that brings me to the second important factor in this, in this uh, recipe, and that's data. And that's uh, obviously, I'm coming from the OECD where evidence-based research is the, the, the mantra, but that is, that is uh, a key ingredient in any good policy making. And also, if, when we're thinking about investment, we have to also think about, and, and, and one word of caution with the, with the European Union's uh, global gateway, it's good to be targeted and it's good to be focused, but because the world is all sorts of things and the problems are, are everywhere, we also need to be inclusive. We need to make sure that we take uh, reality. We cannot just um, uh, impose our policies on a virtual reality that we think it is. We have to take social uh, 
situations in different countries and different regions, and that's uh, exactly what we are doing at the at the center, where we have these three regions, as I as I as I mentioned. Thank you very much, Pavi. You have unfortunately one minute and a half, uh, yeah. but you know, but you are talking about uh, basically, you know, how ordinary people yeah. are employable, you know, but in this asymmetric relation and this environment, which is difficult. Yeah. Please. Yeah, I think Elisabetta had very key words actually in her question. Investor confidence and then private and, uh, sector and civil society. And if I just try to address with two examples those. The investor confidence, of course, it, it's built on, mil on millions of things, but one of, one of them is definitely sort of skilled people and, and ability to actually have recognized uh, qualifications that can be uh, uh, developed in various ways. We are very often very system orientated in many countries, and therefore I would really stress this word recognition, because you have very different environments where you actually gain different skills, and in particular when we look at the adult populations, just transition both in green economy and in digital economy, this is really a key. So the recognition of people's skills in a fair way and systematic way. And the second, perhaps I would mention on this private and civil society, one example in Europe that has been, of course, developed over the last decade or two has been the youth guarantee in different formats in different countries and regions. I had the privilege to be doing the model a little bit in Finland some over 10 years ago, and it's been interesting to look how it has taken root in very different sort of environments. But for instance, that's just an example of a model where your issue is youth employment, but then you find in various communities, countries and regions different approaches, but that typically helps you to bring together the business, the civil society, the social partners, educational institutions, training institutions, depending a little bit on your context. But your goal is the youth guarantee that somehow everyone recognizes as an important goal and therefore buys into it through the common, uh, because of the common goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. We have finished our, our time. Unfortunately, there is no time for, uh, let's say, question and answer. Manuela, one second. one second. For the students, because I'm also a university professor. I see many students here. I suggest you study the case of Niger, because although it is in a very difficult region, it, uh, it, it's developed a model of uh, uh, cooperation with us, and we have developed a model of cooperation with them, which is becoming very fruitful. I would like you know, to raise Niger. your interest, Niger. and maybe this is an opportunity for a Niger. PhD thesis. Ni okay? Niger, Niger <laughs> is a very Sorry. important country and very... Uh, committed country. I have to say thank you very much to everybody. As a School of Transnational Governance, yeah, yeah. I commit process. maybe to organize another discussion on the Global Gateway, but with the, all the partners here discussing about the credibility of our instrument, maybe to enrich the debate, to listen to Latin Americans, to African, to Asian friends, to other in order to have okay. their vision, because this is also partnership, listening to them. Thank you very much to everybody and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. I found a lot of practical experiences uh, related to these issues and I thought it's time for me to take some time off to analyze the policies and look at the gaps and see how we can better campaign for change. It's always uh, interesting to meet people from other parts of the world because these are different cultures meeting, interacting and this is an experience you cannot buy. Academia is great because it helps us to, to, to find concepts to share or ideas, but practice is fundamental in peace building especially because it's something that you have to do day by day. It's not just a set of techniques, it's also a philosophy that you need to start applying. Um, I think I was also very much attracted to the fact that it's not purely academic. I'm not an academic, I've been a practitioner. Um, for the last decade. So I, I, I really appreciated the opportunity to lend my perspective from the policy space, the actual policies, uh, policy space in, in my work. I think this program is designed for someone that really knows what they want to do. And it's a thing balance. You really know what you want to do so you can come here and really look for the resources that will help you in your path. But at the same time, you need to be open-minded to reshape your idea that you have already before coming here and add new elements and come with something that is, is better than you have already planned. My name is Lotta. I'm a third-year uh, doctoral researcher at the Department of Political and Social Sciences. I identify myself as a first-generation 
academic. The EUI has a special initiative for uh, those individuals who identify themselves as first-generation academics. Uh, in other words, that means that uh, they grew up uh, in families with parents or guardians who do not have a university degree. We know uh, from some studies and also from academic life in general that first-generation uh, academics might face some uh, different obstacles or uh, issues, situations throughout their academic careers that they don't know how to navigate with or they might not have the uh, support to ask from their parents. So the, uh, the purpose of the initiative is uh, inclusiveness and uh, just to en enhance uh, diversity within the academia and provide support networks for these first-generation researchers. So the academic services uh, facilitates uh, kind of like networks uh, or these other areas for exchange uh, through, for example, putting together peer groups or uh, they host meetings for first-generation researchers together with some uh, more senior academics and professors included. Uh, the EUI Alumni Association also provides a mentoring program for those who uh, identify as first-generation researchers. And that being said, equally, some of the professors and senior research fellows at the EUI have made themselves uh, available for individual meetings. For myself, uh, it's more of just a kind of this network I know I can rely on, I can go to people, I have contacts uh, if and when I face some uh, obstacles or issues uh, throughout my career. So it is not just for the moment while you're doing your PhD here, but of course you uh, create these uh, support and peer networks that then will last throughout your career. And I think just uh, knowing that there is such a network I can rely on, but also at the same time that uh, to see faces, okay, I'm not the only person uh, who's going through these struggles sometimes. So I think that's just in general very encouraging. Welcome to Villa La Fonte, home of the Department of Economics. This is the library here at Villa La Fonte, with tasks available for, for first-year researchers on a first-time, first-served basis. Here, next door, are some of the working spaces allocated to PhD researchers in the second year now. About 70 desks across seven offices are dedicated to PhD researchers. About half of these desks are equipped with desktop computers. We are here on the terrace of Villa La Fonte, overlooking the gardens. This is a great place for lunch or a coffee. It can also be used as a workspace when you need some fresh air or for meetings. This is a place to bump into both researchers and faculty and a place to be inspired. Welcome to Villa Salviati, home to the Department of History. This is the Sala del Consiglio here at Villa Salviati. It is used for seminars and conferences and can seat up to 150 people. The hall dates back to the 16th century and was originally used as a service area. We are here on the second floor of Villa Salviati, which was originally an open loggia overlooking the courtyard. Today, this area houses 44 workspaces equipped with 17 computers. These spaces are dedicated to PhD researchers in the departments of history and law and are available on a first come, first served basis. This is where researchers can come for a quiet space. It's a great place to work when you need to focus.
Welcome to Villa Salviati, home to the Department of Law. We are here on the second floor of Villa Salviati, which was originally an open loggia overlooking the courtyard. Today, this area houses 44 workspaces equipped with 17 computers. These spaces are dedicated to PhD researchers in the departments of history and law and are available on a first come, first served basis. This is where researchers can come for a quiet space. It's a great place to work when you need to focus. This is the Sala del Consiglio here at Villa Salviati. It is used for seminars and conferences and can seat up to 150 people. The hall dates back to the 16th century and was originally used as a service area. Welcome to the Badia Fisolana the seat of the European University Institute since 1976. The Badia, which dates back to the 12th century, houses the EUI Library, the Office of the President, the Central Administration and the Department of Political and Social Sciences. We are here in the EUI Library, which houses a collection of more than 960,000 books, print and electronic. The collections, together with the services and the infrastructures, make this one of the most internationally recognized social science research libraries in Europe. Among the collections are books in 60 different languages. The library provides access to over 240 databases, as well as an extensive collection of full-text e-journals, e-books and electronic working papers. There are also more than 170 workspaces available on a first-come, first-served basis. Last but not least, the library has the status of European Documentation Centre, an official depository of EU publications and documents. This is the Refectorio, one of the largest spaces here in the Badia, seating up to 200 people. The room is equipped with hybrid conferencing technology and sound diffusion. This is where many seminars, workshops and lectures take place, as well as some of the high-level conferences hosted here at the EY. During the Renaissance, this was the Friars' Refectory, where meals were taken in rigorous silence. The fresco depicts Christ fed by angels and was completed by Giovanni da San Giovanni in the 17th century. in the upper cloister of the Badia, which was originally an open loggia. Today, it is equipped with 28 working spaces, available on a first-come, first-served basis. Here, you will also find access to 12 PCs and 24 screens. This is a great place to work. It is quiet, and if you need a break, you can step out onto the upper loggia to get some fresh air and enjoy a beautiful view of Florence. Welcome to the Menza, the dining hall of the Badia, shared by researchers, faculty, staff and visitors. Lunch is served here from Monday to Friday. You can choose from various menu options, including vegetarian dishes, and there is always a dessert. This is a great place to connect with fellow colleagues and friends. You can also take your lunch out on the terrace and enjoy a panoramic view of Florence.
main impact that Florence had on me is that I now think in a more African-oriented way. Before, I would do my day-to-day -day work and always think Kenya, Kenya, Kenya. Now I have that uh, pers perspective of thinking, uh, you know, uh, it's one thing to do something for your country, but it's a whole other thing to do something for your continent. In so many ways, it was a life-changing experience in terms of how it changed the way I view things uh, in relation to policy issues and, and, and governance issues and so on. But I think what uh, kind of uh, stood out the most to me was the idea of uh, trans the transnationality of things. How whenever you think about anything, you need to think about the transnational aspects of it. And uh, that was obviously because of how the whole idea of the School of Transnational Governance was built on that uh, concept and that idea. And it has honestly really helped me moving forward in terms of thinking about things, uh, how everything that you do uh, has so many other you know, aspects to it beyond the very narrow uh, aspect we usually kind of lo lock ourselves into. Originally, I chose to do the PhD here because uh, of the faculty. So there were two, three members of the faculty where I thought, okay, they might be a good fit research-wise. But then, um, in the end, I talked with a professor from back home who also did his PhD here. And uh, in a sense, what I liked about what he told me is that it's a small institute. He told me about a very interactive type of environment with a lot of interaction between the faculty and the researchers, and which is actually true in the end. And he convinced me also of that here in the. Uh, applications during the applications and so I decided okay it might be a good fit for me and then on top of all of that of course there's the city of Florence which is uh, it's a beautiful place to stay for five years and do your PhD. EUI Economics Department is located in a beautiful large Tuscan villa we call it Villa La Fonte. Um, it's like a second home you get out of your home and you walk to your work and that's another home. So our offices are located in this beautiful place um, and then what makes it very special is we are all living in that big villa. Us, faculty members, and also our PhD students and a few postdocs every year we have. I think what's unique about the UI is really the fact that it's an institution that's only uh, there to do research. So you feel it with the professors, you always have uh, their ear, they're always there to, to listen to you because they have to work on their research and the other only, only other thing on their plate is essentially your research. And you also realize that with all your, your colleagues. So I think in a sense, this opportunity to be in the building with uh, say 80 other PhD students that all are very active and you have a constant feedback on what you're doing is I think something that is at least of course, I don't have the counterfaction because I'm not attending another program, but uh, what I heard from other programs is not as strong there. So, and I think there's something that you should not underestimate when you're, when you're thinking about where to do the PhD and how to really get a good thesis done. In terms of the topics that the faculty covers, it's actually quite wide. We have a very, very strong macroeconomics group and very strong uh, theory, micro theory group. And similarly very strong applied micro group. The applied micro group uh, covers uh, a wide range of topics from development economics, education, gender, labor economics, health and more. So we cover quite a few uh, good economics topics for our PhD students. What is a bit non-standard I would say with respect to other PhD programs is what I already said that it's a small department so you're all in the same building with the whole faculty. So you meet your professors all the time. You meet them during lunch and for coffee breaks and in a sense um, you have always someone to talk to. So uh, I think this creates a nice, nice atmosphere to do research. The supervision is very close, very hands-on, although every professor, of course, they have their own styles, uh, generally we interact. And what makes us really special is this close contact and the, the continuous feedback, the, 
PhD students receive from us, not only from us, but also their peers because it's a close community and with a very positive culture. Uh, it's not just us they are limited to in terms of good feedback. It's also their peers, upper cohorts, lower cohorts, and the postdocs. The student life at the UI is a bit like uh, going back to high school, I'd say. So you, you start in a sense with a, with a cohort of uh, 20 people, you go through a first year where you all have to work a lot, so you're essentially you get to know everybody. Uh, it's super easy to get in touch with people, and this also is kind of fostered by the UI. So there's like a bunch of activities to do. There's uh, here is now okay, we're shooting this in June. I don't know when it's. Uh, um, there's the Copa Pavone coming up, which is a football tournament here UI wide. You can play basketball. You can do all types of activities. Go to the cinema club, whatever. So. It's not boring, it's very, very active, and I think uh, it's a nice way to spend your, your time. Another special side of EUI economics is its, its interdisciplinary approach to economics. Especially on the applied micro side, we have very close contact with uh, SPS department, and we have very close contact with the history department. We do, uh, we do accomplish this via good working groups, and uh, join conferences and a general informal talks with the, with, the, with the faculty members. For example, myself, I'm running uh, with, uh, with, a, with an SBS faculty, an experimental working group just for our PhD students, economics and SBS and other PhD students to give them feedback about their uh, pre-analysis plans, like before they execute their research, how they should go about it and, 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 and similar issues. So, so there's, 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 there are good bridges across across departments, especially from uh, economics to um, uh, social and political sciences here. So this is, this is especially important, I'm underlying because I'm somebody who's, who values interdisciplinary research a lot and do interdisciplinary research a lot and we'd like to tell the students uh, who want to apply to EUI that's so open to them in this environment. My primary reason to choose to do my research at the UI is the amount of academic freedom you have here compared to other universities. In general, other universities, other universities have uh, certain programs, uh, the faculties have certain programs they would like to research and if you want to apply to a PhD there you will have to change your research if you already have a research idea to fit the, the programs that they have the funding for. And at the UI this is not the case. You apply here with your own research proposal and your own research interests, which you also are not stuck with. If you want to make changes in the first year, that's still possible, but you have complete freedom in actually doing the research that really interests you. I think for a PhD that, you know, it takes four years of your life, it's quite an intensive thing. I think that's just so important to also keep your interests and I think if you if you have to maybe adjust your interests to fit, to fit something else, you, you're more likely to maybe lose your interest down the line. We're a relatively small department. We have 12 professors, 12 full-time professors and a couple of part-time professors. Um, though we're small, we're perfectly formed of course. Uh, we cover a wide range of different subject areas within law, so constitutional law, EU law, international law, comparative law and so on. And we, we're a diverse department in the sense that we adopt a wide range of different perspectives to the study of law. So we have um, critical perspectives, socio-legal perspectives, empirical perspectives. So although we're small, uh, we, you know, we, we encourage applications from students from a very wide range of perspectives uh, and topics. Doing your PhD here at the Department of Law at the UI, it's, uh, it's very well structured. I think they help PhD researchers here a lot to uh, maintain somewhat of a steady progress. There's deadlines at the end of every study year, first, second, third year at least, and fourth year obviously should be done with your thesis. I think that helps a lot for researchers to stay on track, know where they're at, maybe have more confidence as well in their own ability to finish it in time. Um, I think that helps a lot in general and, and, and there's a great 
community to help you develop your research, find perhaps areas of research you didn't know about but would be immensely useful. There's professors, there's fellow researchers that do different things, but quite often even though they do different uh, things, have different research interests, they still come to uh, help you in your research by suggesting certain avenues of literature you hadn't thought about. And I feel like everyone here is always very open to help you, very open to have a conversation at least, either over lunch or coffee or in their office. And I think that really is extremely helpful. I think that leads to being able to do the best research you can. The relationship between a researcher and a research supervisor varies a lot because it depends on the supervisor and on the researcher. And it also varies by year. So the, the researcher can expect to have a reasonably intense relationship with their supervisor in their first year. So for example, I would expect to see my first year researchers every couple of weeks in their first term. Maybe that would be every three or four weeks in the second term, unless the researcher is experiencing particular problems or difficulties. And normally before uh, a professor meets a, a researcher, they would often ask the researcher to submit something to them that they can read, so there's a basis for having a conversation. So I'd say, uh, aside, from it, aside from seminars, the two main uh, things that a supervisor offers are a reading and commenting service and then a meeting opportunity to discuss the researchers ideas and we have you know because we're a relatively small department we, we do have quite close contact with our researchers which is one of the most rewarding bits of the job for us and I think one of the most rewarding aspects of the EUI for the researchers. Obviously the social life at the EUI has been very different to the last year and a half I think that's true for anywhere in the world um, but Taking the, the social life as it was the year and a half I was here before COVID uh, started, uh, I think it's a very vibrant life. There is definitely a danger of getting so much into an EOI bubble because there's just so much on offer here. There's extracurricular activities for nearly everything and even if they're what you would like to do, whether it's a sport or a hobby or interest, uh, if it's not there, you have the possibility to create that if you find like-minded people. But even outside of the UI and, uh, and the activities that are organized here, there's still the whole city of Florence where there's plenty of things you can do there as well. There's social activities, there's a beautiful city to discover. And in general, I think it's just a, a great place to be. And if you, in the first month you're here, really buckle down and learn as much Italian as possible, I think you can really enjoy the city even outside the EUI premise. People would be maybe um, one of the most important reasons to, to study here. Um, I would say also, well, it's a very unusual institution. You don't find many international institutions which focus exclusively on uh, PhD and LLM research, so it's exclusively doctoral and postdoctoral, um, and that, that creates a, a, a really wonderful atmosphere. Um, the, the students, and of course we call them researchers, are, are, are scholars in their own right, and they interact with one another as scholars, so oh, it's a very intellectually serious and challenging environment, and it, it certainly is that. Um, it's also a very supportive and friendly environment where the researchers really help one another develop their ideas and their projects in a way that I've simply never seen anywhere else. So now, you know, when I see our graduates out and about in, in conferences and so on, I can always identify an EUI researcher, you know, because they've, they've had so much practice sharing ideas with their peers, with their professors, that they're just very accomplished at presenting their research which also, of course, in career terms, it's, it's an advantage. I would recommend the EUI mostly for all the above reasons, the academic freedom, you're pursuing your own research interests, great professors, great fellow researchers, a great environment in general. And I think if all of that doesn't convince someone yet, then it's still very nice weather in Tuscany as well. It's beautifully situated, 
uh, I think you'll be very hard pressed to find a location as beautiful as this. And somehow that also is very inspiring to work and continue working. Doing PhD at SPS is, um, I think first of all, what is this to be doing a PhD? I think this is a good question to ask. For me personally, doing a PhD, it's a, it's a time in your life or it's a moment, it's a possibility to change your identity. This is because doing a PhD is probably one of the very few environments or possibilities or professional opportunities to have you work on something that you are really interested in yourself and that is not mandated by a supervisor. It changes your identity in, 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 in a way because it makes you think and ponder over what it is that really interests you, what it is that you really want to do, and not only substantively speaking, but also um, how you want to work, you know? What are the methods that you want to, that you want to use in your work? I think doing PhD is a very challenging experience. And I think that the EUI or SPS, what it provides you with is a fantastic community that you can, that you can, that is very supportive of this process, of this process of you finding yourself. People are always moving here. We don't have tenure, so the faculty is always circulating and every year we get a new cohort of fresh doctoral researchers from all over Europe. Everybody's starting new. It's a lot of fun. And here at the EUI, writing a dissertation is not a lonely journey. You have your cohort, you have your supervisor, many supervisors meet together with their supervisees in groups, you have requirements that everybody is doing at the same time, so you have a lot of company and a lot of support. It's, this is a very supportive community for writing a doctoral dissertation. Yes, student life at EY, well, it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic life. <laughs> it's a wonderful life. Um, yes, we are, you know, we live here together in this wonderful city. Um, it's not only that, you know, we, we are at this beautiful university where we get all of these opportunities to, you know, fantastic library and resources, etc. We also spend a lot of time with each other after work. Um, so we go out a lot, um, people do loads of different sports, you know, people would go biking or hiking or, um, oh, I recently started playing tennis, for instance, because there are tennis courts right, uh, right next to the EY. So there's a lot of opportunity for leisure, for spending time together, for, you know, which is also conducive um, for us to come up with research ideas. You know, many people here start working together on projects um, and it's fantastic also to see. So yeah, student life is amazing. <laughs> A new PhD student should expect coming into our department is first of all a very warm welcome. We have a September program where we introduce the incoming researchers to the different faculty research areas. The EUI provides Italian courses, we have social events, and we have some uh, courses that get people ready for their first semester, so introduction to some of the computer programs they'll be using. I would recommend anyone who is curious and has lust for knowledge, I would rec recommend them to do a PhD at UI because I think it gives you just all necessary ingredients for you to try yourself out and see whether this is something for you. Precisely thanks to the you know, funding that you receive, great community, just, you know, wonderful life that gives you this mental space to, to think about your interest and, and work on your project of interest. Our department is a very congenial group of 11 or 12 professors. We uh, focus our work generally on early modern and modern European history. But all of us have an interest in Europe's relationship to the rest of the globe. So I would say we think of Europe 
uh, we think we think of a Europe that's looking outward rather than inward. In my previous university, the EUI was known for its high standards of academic research, uh, the unique curriculum, and also the internationally recognized faculty. I was especially encouraged by my master's thesis to supervisor to apply. When added together with the fact that EUI is domiciled in one of the best cities of the world, uh, especially for a historian, uh, I, EUI was my first choice. We have a very special uh, relatively unique culture in our department. Uh, I think someone should apply uh, to do their PhD with us uh, because they will become part of a community. We all work together as a group. We're not individuals, we're not isolated. Of course, the work of a PhD does involve a lot of research on your own, but we come together as often as we can to share our work uh, and to discuss it and to exchange ideas. I think the supervision at the EUI is also a very unique uh, because, um, at least from my personal experience, uh, I received a lot of constructive feedback about my research project. I would say that the relationship between supervisor and researcher is the most critical relationship here. Uh, the relationship is close and professional. Uh, we work with our PhD researchers as with colleagues, I would say. We, we don't uh, tell them what to do, but we do work with them on shaping their topics, on developing their projects. Each researcher brings a topic that we are excited about and we want to help them with. So our job as supervisor is to facilitate their work. At the EY you will find many student clubs and many extracurricular activities, uh, despite the last year's uh, health conditions, public health conditions, uh, from sports to arts uh, and culture, uh, through which you can not only meet new people, uh, but also grow as a person. I think the researcher can also expect a great deal of support when it comes to resources. Our department funds missions every year so that researchers can go uh, to on-site archives and libraries in Europe and sometimes outside of Europe uh, to do their specialized research. Uh, we also support their uh, activity in participating, say, international conferences. The department supports the researchers' career prospects really from the first year on. We want to develop in our researchers the kinds of skills they're going to need for the various types of professions that historians can pursue after the PhD. History department is a very unique place where you will find many different innovative and interdisciplinary approaches to the field of history. And you will find many events, workshops uh, and meetings uh, where you could improve uh, your standpoint in your own field of research, but also get introduced to the, some new ones.